Hello, everybody, and welcome into my latest live broadcast. It is Friday, St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. And today, I was going somewhere with that and I lost my train of thought. That's how you know it's live. Or is it? No, it is. Now, uh, today we're going to do some more exploration of the many, many options of many PCs that have sort of uh, become very, very affordable. And a lot of new manufacturers or manufacturers are new to me in this space. We've been focusing mainly on three of the bigger manufacturers or the better known manufacturers in the mini PC space. And that is, uh, of course, our friends at Minis Forum, which we'll be looking at today, Ace Magician and B-Link. Now, there are many, many, many other manufacturers of mini PCs. However, uh, these three are um, special to me because they offer something unique. They're not just rebadging the same old stuff. So Minis Forum, for example, has a lot of unique design characteristics that you simply don't find anywhere else. And I want to thank Phil over at Minis Forum for sending us today's review computer, which is a UM773. Now, I have been exploring lately a lot of the inexpensive, cheaper options of the mini PCs. You can pick them up starting at about $169 with an operating system installed, typically with Windows 11 installed. And those are just entry-level machines good for everyday, typical consumer use. But if you're a creator or if you're a gamer, you need something more powerful than that, and that's going to cost you more money. So um, the, I'm, I'm going to segregate them into three tiers. Your budget or entry-level mini PCs, your mid-range PCs, and then your high-end enthusiast mini PCs. Now, as the expense goes up, so does the power consumption. Sometimes the size of the case actually gets larger as well. I've seen some mini PCs that were pretty large. Uh, the Intel Nook, which was the first mini PC that I've ever explored, was in 2013, in April of 2013. So we're nearly, nearly 10 years from my first experience with the mini PCs. And uh, that original one from 2013 still works today, though it's only a Core i3. It, uh, it's a bit less responsive than it used to be because of the resource, um, the amount of resources modern antivirus and modern Windows takes to run smoothly. So while it still works, it's not as useful because it's not as responsive. But that being said, um, we also have the upcoming sunsetting of Windows 10. And when I say upcoming, we're still almost three years away before you have to worry about anything. Uh, October, mid-October 2025 is when support ends for Windows 10. So you definitely want to be into Windows 11 or some other supported operating system by January of 2026 at the latest. So if you're looking at these mini PCs today that come equipped with Windows 11, you're good to go indefinitely until some other requirements change, which are not here yet. So that being said, uh, this is a mid-range. I would consider this a mid-range mini PC. And we're going to take a look at the specs here in just a moment, but I want to take a second to say hello to everybody. And uh, I see our good friend, uh, Buster, known as Peter Laycock in the chat room, contributed 10 pounds and also an Amazon gift card earlier. He says, good evening, Carrie and Marlena and everyone in the chat. All the best from Bonnie, Scotland, where the temperature in Edinburgh is 48 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 9 degrees centigrade. Hey, thank you so, so much for checking in with us. Hope you're doing well. And uh, I'm going to start naming the show after Peter Laycock at this point. He's very generous. And uh, always good to see our friend from Scotland here in the chat, although we have several, don't we? But... Uh, Speaking of uh, generosity, a Super Chat contribution just came in from Ferris for $5 and says, Hey, Carrie, I hope you've been well. I love the content around these mini PCs. Keep up the great work. Well, thank you, Ferris. I'm trying. I'm trying. I have yet more mini PCs to review coming up. After a while, I'll switch it up to something else. Uh, I've got that big 13900KS system to build. We'll bring Mitch back to help with that. So a lot of content coming your way in the weeks ahead. So I want to focus on what today's review about is about, which is a 
what I consider an upper mid-range, sort of, sort of at the top of the mid-range, mini PC from Minis Forum. Now, if you look in the video description in today's video, you will see the link to this product there. And I'm just going to show it to you. I'm going to switch over on my browser. And let's go to my window capture mode in the OBS software that I use to broadcast. And I will tell it to show... Show that screen if I can find it. Bear with me here just one second. Um, hmm, doesn't seem to be letting me open that page. What is it bringing up? It's bringing up a black screen. <laughs> okay, well, that explains that. I don't know why um, it won't show my or share my uh, Chrome page. Bear with me here as I deal with these little technical glitches while we're live. There it is. Okay. I don't know what happened, but now we should be able to see it. Okay, so this is what we're going to be looking at today. The Minis Forum UM773 Lite. Now, I've got two links in the video description. One is a shortened URL that's going to take you to the main page. When you go to the main page, you're not going to see the computer. We're going to, it defaults to a version of this that's not out yet that you can pre order. It's also a bit on the feminine side with pink and some sort of flowers on it. Uh, so don't let that confuse you if that's where the link takes you, because if you click the next item down, you'll see the next few pictures down are uh, what we're looking at today. This is just a version of that or SE version. And then of course there are different configurations and you'll notice that's gonna be the same here when we look at what is essentially the same exact computer with, different, uh, with a different case on it. And as you can see, they have two different versions. We're doing the L-I-T-E, the light version, which is a Ryzen 7. So that's, like I say, it's at the upper end of the mid-range or the low end of the high range. It's like right in the middle there. It sells for $529 if you configure it with 16 gigs of RAM with a 512 gig solid state drive. You can get it bare bones, meaning you have to put in your own RAM in your own solid state drive for just 409 and of course they have an option for 32 gigs of RAM and 512 storage or 32 gigs of RAM with a terabyte storage or 64 gigs of RAM. And you can see as I'm changing these boxes how the price up here is changing. And then of course you can get it with a, uh, power adapters designed for the US, Australia or the UK. And it does say if you're in Europe to click here to go to that website and uh, Great Britain and what is IE? Ireland? Anyway, so they have different websites so that the um, currency rate and, and uh, you're, not, you're not paying any conversion fees when you're buying it. And uh, we look at these pictures here. You'll notice like before on the mini forum PC we looked at before, it has that similar optional stand you can place it in, which I personally like. I've never seen that from any other mini PC manufacturer. And like I said, Minis Forum is developing, apparently, developing their own proprietary um, designs and configurations. Well, more than just the configuration, the entire cooling system and how they go about it is a bit more complex than most. And um, we will get the close up camera out here in a second so I can show you the unboxing. Let me just make a few adjustments here in OBS. Okay. Hello to Mark Leibowitz and Green Dragon, Rob Dvorak and Patrick Manny, Gil Garcia and Paul Garrett, Kevin Crowley, our friend Rick Lakes, Sarge Tech, Shamim. Kishwaras, Kisharas, Kish, Kish, <laughs> I'm going to pronounce this, Shamim, 
Keshavarez. American Legend and Seven Snow say hello. There's Kurt Schlegel and Chris Johnson. AV3, Luke Greenia, Garfield Rupe, Bradley Morris says hello, Arto, Arto Rusenin, Gary Tatum, Wayne Pierce, Carlos Hernandez, David Chandler, Pete Tracker34, Paul Garrett says, hello, it's Saturday morning here in Australia. Breakfast time, cornflakes and carry. What a way to start the day. <laughs> hot, sorry, it's not hot, it's Hal. Hal Grubb says, hello. Mark Gaines says, hello. Thing One uh, sent me a really nice email the other day and, a, and an Amazon gift card. Thank you to Thing One for that. And well, I haven't given it the full response it deserves, maybe if if thing one agrees, I'll share his email with the audience. If not, well, then that's fine too. And uh, Ron Barnish saying hello, as well as Sherry McFarland. Always good to see my friends here. And Dave E. All right. I just want to give everybody a shout out. I hope I got everybody. Les Stevenson, Scott A., Steve Larkin, Curtis Stollery, Channel Zero, Fred Adcock, Horatio, Alhej, Mortant, and Jeff H. All right, guys. Shall we get the close-up camera going? Should we get this moving? Put camera girl to work here. Let me activate the close-up camera. Okay, come on over. You, you're active. Come on over. All right, so this... In here. This is how it's shipped. Take, one of the things I like about these is, you know, if I'm shipping a computer, these are much smaller and lighter to ship. Also, there's really nothing to break in this. Uh, the only moving part this thing has is the cooling fan for the CPU, and it's much like a laptop cooling solution. So my anxiety about is it going to arrive without damage? Uh, and what's it going to cost me to ship? All that goes away with these. And you're looking at essentially uh, the same processing power as the equivalent desktop. And they end up being not only smaller, taking up less space, running cooler, but also um, be, um, being less expensive than an equivalent desktop. I mean, price one out yourself. Price out a motherboard, uh, the same CPU, same amount of RAM, same amount of storage with a power supply, Windows 11, a cooler, what am I missing? Uh, Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, that's all in here. And the sticker here just kind of gives away that the, what it's got is 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gig of storage. On the back, they've got some information about a service. This company is based in Hong Kong. And this is what they call their Venus series. Now, for full disclosure, the folks at Minis Forum did send this PC to me, but they are not paying me for this review. Uh, furthermore, if you click on any of my links that take you to Amazon, I make a small commission. You don't pay any more, and I don't know who you are that's making the purchase. I can only see what was purchased and when, so I know what the commissions are owed to me from Amazon. It's a nice anonymous way to support the channel. Or if you prefer, you can order directly from the folks at Minis Forum. Now, this particular model I did not find on Amazon as of today. So the only way I think you can get this is through Minis Forum directly. Now, let's open it up and see how they pack it up. I did open this earlier to just go through the Windows updates. So you guys don't have to be bored out of your mind watching Windows Update itself. That's true of any new PC. As soon as you get a new PC, you should always... Once you hook it up, first thing I do, go to Windows Update, let it get all the updates, reboot and repeat until there are no more updates. We do not recommend customers remove the CPU cooler themselves. They, the folks at Minis Forum, remember I said they had a unique way that they cool, and that is through using liquid metal. And the problem that I have with liquid metal 
is that over time it can oxidize and then it actually can be less efficient than regular thermal compound. But Phil at Minis Forum, re he reassures me that the application method that they use reduces the chances of that happening. And if it does happen, it extends that. And so it's with most liquid metal applications that people do themselves, they're gonna to have to redo that in a couple of years. Minis Forum is saying the way that they apply it is very unique and that it's designed to last for the lifetime of the PC. All right, so back to the box here. What we've got, to give you some perspective of size, this is, I think, a little more than five inches each way and just a couple inches deep. We've got uh, vents on each side This is apparently the front. We've got two USB 3s over here, it looks like. This looks like a micro uh, headset. And then that's just headphones there. But that could be uh, just a microphone or a headset, which includes uh, speakers, basically, right? Because if you're wearing a headset, you have speakers and a microphone on your head. There's our power button right there and I guess this little hole here is where you stick a straightened out paper clip to reset it if it ever hard locks on you. Now I haven't had to do that in well on any computer with Windows 10 quite frankly and I imagine since Windows 11 is mostly just Windows 10 with a different skin on it I don't think people are going to be needing that uh, reset switch so I'm glad it's recessed so you don't accidentally press it. Now looking at the back you'll see we've got a lot of USB ports, a couple USB 3's couple USB 2s, two HDMI outs. So that means with the two HDMI outs and that USB type C, we could do three monitors simultaneously out of this bad boy. We've got a gigabit ethernet connector, which is the Intel, I think it's the two, 225V and our barrel power connector there. And then this little slot right up here, that's for a Kensington style lock. That's if this was in a place where you're worried somebody might steal it. So you just uh, insert the Kensington style lock into the hole and turn the key and it has a little, um, almost like a, like a deadbolt on a door, it springs out on each side. And the other end, it's a steel braided cable. And the other end you would secure to something that's bolted down. So there's no way anybody's taking this without breaking it. You'd have to, and I, and I don't know if you even could break it, it might be easier to just cut through the, the Kensington lock at that point. So in any event, it's very well equipped with IO. It's got some decent weight to it. If we look back over in the box, see what else they've included. We have the power brick, which we are going to need. And that tells us all about the voltage requirements It uses a standard PC power cable to go to the brick. I really like that a lot because that's a pretty standard cable. Anybody with a computer probably has these laying around. And you'll see they've given us the US version of the plug. We've got a short HDMI cable here, and that's if you want to mount this to the back of your monitor so you don't even have to see it. People will think you've got some kind of an all-in-one. And most HDMI cables people have are five or six feet long. This is nice that it's a shorter cable. Here's our little base, which of course is optional. I like it. I think it gives Minis Forum uh, a unique way to stand out in much the same way that automobile manufacturers have a unique grill design on the front of the car. You can often tell from looking in your rear view mirror if you're, you know, what make of car you're, that's behind you. So there's the little stand. And then finally, we have a couple rubber feet here, which I suppose it looks like to open this up, we have to remove the rubber feet. I'm not a fan of that because what happens when you need to open it again, I wish they had drilled some holes in the bottom um, through the rubber feet so the rubber feet did not have to come off. Not that that's the end of the world, it's just... I open stuff up a lot, so uh, 
my advice to you is, if you're going to buy one of these, uh, just keep that in mind that if you've got to open it, you're going to have to find a way to reattach these feet. If you use your spare feet, then I suppose you're going to have to get creative with how you're going to glue the feet back. Uh, we've got our visa bracket. As mentioned, you can mount this to the back of a monitor that supports that. And we've got some screws in here, and it looks like the screws are both for mounting the visa bracket to the back of the computer with these holes in the middle, as well as screws for what appear to be the addition of a two and a half inch solid state or mechanical drive, a two and a half inch storage drive optionally could fit in there. Now, what you should know about these mini PCs is typically everything's, what, if you're familiar with computers, then it appears from the ports that, um, that in many cases the CPU is up on the bottom. But as you can tell with the vent holes on the top, and you can kind of even look through the vent holes, the CPU fan, it looks like, kind of get in there, faces up. And sometimes on these mini PCs, it's on the bottom. So just be aware of that. And whatever you do, don't block the vents. It's very important on these upper end mini PCs, they are going to generate some heat because they generate more performance, which requires more power. It's going to generate more heat. Pretty logical. I'm going to set this right here into the, the little stand, and it's a very tight fit. If you notice that little grommet there kind of slides around. That way it's not going to slide out. So that's what it's gonna look like in the stand. I'm gonna put the rest of this stuff back in the box because we don't need any of it. All we need is the power brick. And we're gonna plug this in and turn it on. As I mentioned, off camera, I did updates on it, but I have not done any testing to see how fast the drive is or what sort of performance we actually get out of it. So we'll do that together live on camera. Brightstar Man with a $10 contribution in Super Chat says, Here's my late fee. <laughs> Thanks, for Star Man. All right. So let's see. Uh, let's, I don't know how I want to situate that. Okay. Let's start by putting the barrel connector in for power. We'll set that over there. I've got a keyboard and mouse that I'm going to use. This is just a pretty inexpensive, very small, lightweight very portable keyboard and mouse. And it uses just this one dongle for both keyboard and mouse. And both keyboard and mouse have rechargeable batteries that uh, charge up through USB. So I never have to replace batteries in these. I do turn them off even though they auto shut off after a certain amount of no activity. But that's just my OCD when I'm done with something. Um, I power it off to make to ensure to myself that I'm extending the battery life as much as possible. Not that it's a big deal to charge them. They don't take very long to charge up. Generally, I go about three or four months uh, between charges. These keyboard mice combos, that's all in my Amazon store, which you'll find a link to in the video description, along with pretty much everything else you see in my videos, just so you know. Okay, so we got the keyboard, the mouse, the power brick. Now I have to plug a standard PC power cable into the power brick, and I've got to plug an HDMI cable into the capture card. So I'm going to step around. And let's see here. I've got an HDMI cable right here. We can plug it into the network. Right there. And as previously mentioned, a standard PC power cable. And I'll just leave it up there for now. Now, I'm going to switch over to the HDMI input for the mini PC so you guys can see how long it takes to boot. Wrong mouse, Carrie. I have to come over here and use this one. So I'm going to go back to camera one. You're clear. Thank you. And I'm going to turn on the HDMI input, and then I'm going to 
take camera one and I'm going to put it up here in a corner. Oh, that ought to be good. All right, we'll see what it takes, how long it takes to boot. Here's the power button. If you listen very carefully, you can hear the fan spin up and then it slows down just like a standard desktop PC would do. We get our minis for them uh, post screen and you'll see the that Windows is loading. And there we are with Windows 11. Let me go full screen so I can see it on my side. And as you can see, I've done the standard routine on this with the VLC uh, media player that I put on all PCs. My uncle carries Windows 10 optimization tool, which does work in Windows 11. I don't know how helpful it is, but nonetheless, that's, that's there. And let's see what we've got installed here. AMD Ryzen 7, 7735HS with Radeon graphics at 3.2 gig. 16 gigs of RAM, 13.7 gig is usable because the built-in video card needs to borrow memory from your system. It doesn't have its own. The machine comes with Windows 11 Professional, and you'll see it's version 21H2. Is that right? Is that the latest? I was thinking the latest was 20, 22H2. I'm getting getting old and confused. Um, I'll tell you what, let's quickly go to Windows Update and make sure that it's not going to offer us a big Windows update here. Oh, I have to go here. <laughs> Silly me. Here we go. Uh, it is downloading. It started downloading in the background. A cumulative update, and then of course the it runs the Windows malicious removal tool, malicious software removal tool. Generally once a month, you'll see this a lot in Windows Update. If you're wondering what it is, it's always going to scan once a month to look for any malicious software. So you're not getting the same update over and over again. Uh, that does confuse some people. With regards to the size of the drive, let's see what it has here. Go to this PC, go to Properties, and it does have the 512 gig drive as advertised. That checks out. If I click on the hardware tab, we can see that it's made by Kingston. So it's a Kingston. Is it NVMe or solid or SATA solid state? Um, for that, we would have to run a test or open it up and inspect it. And quite frankly, I'm I really don't want to open this up. Let's see. Where's my utilities? Here we go. Well, it's downloading the updates. I don't want to run any performance tests because it's not really fair. Well, it's trying to run the speed test while it's working in the background. It's not going to give us accurate results. But what I can do is copy over some of the PC testing software that I want to run once the updates are done. So we can use uh, HW Info and Prime95 if we want to torture it and see if it overheats. CPU-Z is a great utility to just verify all of the hardware, motherboard, RAM, all the details of the RAM. Crystal Disk Info and Crystal Disk Mark. I think we'll just grab Crystal Disk Mark because we know we... I use Crystal Disk Info to identify the make and model of the drive, but we can see it's a Kingston. So beyond that, I don't much care. And sometimes Crystal Disk Info doesn't give us that much detail. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. So we've copied those over. I don't think I need anything else off this, off this USB flash drive. So I'll just go ahead and take that out and set it aside. And we'll kind of keep an eye on the updates. Now my internet connection is pretty slow here. So that's why I tried to get this done off camera. But in the meantime, since I want my tests to be accurate, uh, I want to wait for this process to finish. And I want to do the updates just in case they have some improvement in performance. Updates generally offer better security, better reliability, and in some cases, better performance. And it varies from one update to the other. My general rule of thumb is collect them all. And then once you have all your updates in place, 
I have not made any changes to the BIOS. Everything is as set from the factory. We'll see how it runs. And if it gets loud, and if so, how loud? Does anyone have any questions about this unit or about mini PCs in general while we're waiting? And I'll do my best to provide an answer. Uh, I may not have the answer, but also be sure and watch the chat room because many of our chat participants uh, are brighter than me and uh, may have the answer right there on the top of their head or might be more familiar with the unit. They might even own one of these and can tell us more about it than I can. So uh, I encourage, if you're watching live, to jump into the chat room and say hello. All right, we have a very friendly chat room. We have an amazing absolutely amazing community here that's, you know, as far as I'm concerned, the most valuable part of my whole channel is the community. And I, we'd like, all of us would like very much to continue to grow the community with other like-minded, uh, supportive individuals. If you're a kind person, come on in. Be nice. You're welcome to stay as long as you like. Doesn't cost you anything. On the other hand, if you're looking to challenge, if you are looking to prove how smart you are, wrong place for you. Um, we don't care about any of that stuff. We only care if you're nice. That's all that matters. We don't care your age. We don't care your gender. We don't care your religion. I don't care what country you're from. None of that matters, as long as you're nice. So it's a strange thing to have to request, but this is, this is how it is in 2023. Uh, let's see, jumping back in the chat. Les Stevenson says, Happy St. Patrick's Day. Yes, back at you. I don't have anything green. I had this uh, shirt with my logo made, I think two, two or three years ago, and I didn't like the color. And I decided to wear something different. I thought I had one in green, but I don't. And it's very tight. <laughs> it's very uncomfortable. But uh, wow. it's... Uh, Camera girl likes it, so there you have it. Let's see. Richard Stillman said, the reviews are great, but I'm missing the repair videos. Well, here's the thing, Richard. I just did a repair video, too, this week, but they're for members only. There, there is a, there's a, you can subscribe to the channel for free. The problem with the repair videos is a lot of clients don't want their machines shown to a bunch of strangers online. So I always have to get client permission. And when I switch over to members only on certain content, it's because it's not safe for me to put out to the public. So repair videos, well, I'm not doing as many of them. Um, I just did one this week. It was pretty interesting too. Um, I think, I, what did I do that? Tuesday and Wednesday or? Wednesday and Thursday, and there was kind of a lesson there to be learned in it. And of course, our good friend Doug Betts from Live Windows Training with Doug Betts' YouTube channel called in. And when I do those members only videos, they stay members only. They never become public because there's information conveyed there that um, I wouldn't convey in a regular public video that anybody could potentially use to harass me or identify the customer to harass them. That's unfortunate. I know the people that pay the membership fee, they're there for the right reason, and I want to give them exclusive content to reward them for supporting me and for making more of these videos possible. Now, that being said, if you have a repair that you need done, it's Windows 10 or Windows 11, and you want to reach out to me and see if there's something that I can do to help you to show the repair, you feel free to reach out to me at my email address. And... Uh, see if we can work something out. Just bear in mind, I'm in Phoenix, and it costs around $100, $130 to ship a regular tower computer across the United States. I can't help anybody outside of the U.S. because of import and export issues and the likelihood of damage given that distance of shipping. So, of course, if you're local to the Phoenix or Maricopa County area, certainly reach out. That's much, much easier to pick up or drop off, uh, have a computer dropped off than dealing with the mail. Uh, that being said, I appreciate the feedback and do know there is other content 
that you don't know is there if you're not a member. And again, it's unfortunate I had to do it, but I'm glad I did because it really, I, I know when I make those members only videos, nobody's going to attack me. You know, I don't have to be defensive. I don't have to be cautious about what I show. I don't, I'm not under the magnifying glass, you know, of scrutiny. So it's more relaxed. It's more like just some friends hanging out. And because of them, I'm able to make more content because of their monthly contributions to become members, that money all goes back into the channel. So uh, in any event, that's why things are shifting and changing is just so I can keep making videos and keep making them more often. And the people who enable that, I make content just for them as a, my way of showing gratitude. Okay, let's see. Uh, Garfield Rupe said, I'm sure I saw an Ace Magician mini PC for two different prices. One was $899, the other was $440. I then saw one on Amazon. I'm sure they were both gaming PCs. I don't think I've gone bad. So all these manufacturers, Ace Magician, Mini, Swarm, and B-Link that I've been focusing on have a variety, a catalog of mini PCs that they make to accomplish different categories or to accomplish different tasks needs, desires, and budgets of the potential customer. As a result, it's like when you go shopping for a car. You can buy an entry-level Ford. You can buy a mid-level Ford. You can buy a luxury Ford, and then you get into Lincoln, right? And I'm saying Ford, but I could literally replace that with Nissan, Honda, Toyota, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The more you pay, the more you get. And if there's a price difference, then it's likely because it's a different PC. You might be confusing the manufacturer or you might be confusing how it's specced out. So you might see two identical cars and one's 30,000 more dollars than the other one, but what you can't see is what's under the hood or what, uh, what features, and um, what's the word? Just I'm gonna just say features, horsepower, transmission type, engine size, the number of gears it has and the transmission, um, whatever bells, whistles, and features it might have, like heated seats or leather seats or sunroof or built-in garage door opener. Anyway, generally speaking, in this industry, in, in the tech industry, you generally get what you pay for. So if you're seeing a PC that's $900 and it looks like the PC that's half, there's two possibilities there. The first and most likely possibility is that um, there's a major difference in how they're equipped. The second is that you're looking at a scalper. That can happen, especially at sites like Newegg and Amazon, when they run out of a product, but they have a third-party seller offering the same product. That becomes the default option, and it can be a preposterous price. Some third-party sellers are scalpers, and they're counting on making a sale from somebody who doesn't know what something is worth. They didn't do their research. They might wrongly assume they're ordering from Newegg or Amazon because neither one of those companies really makes it obvious that you're not buying directly from them. However, pay attention to the specifications and how it's equipped, and it will probably become clear to you if it's just equipped differently to justify that difference in price, or if you're dealing with a scalper and that the product is not actually being sold directly by the retailer. Is Mercury around anymore? I don't think so. I don't think Mercury is, I have no idea. I haven't seen a Mercury in a long time. Find me in Hawaii says, Carrie, I really enjoyed the lessons learned on the members only videos. I was on the edge of my seat and biting my nails. It should have been trending on Netflix. Well, that's very kind of you. Uh, that again, it's a different tone, right? I'm far more relaxed. I feel like everybody's there for the right reason. And I know the vast majority of you are here for the right reason, but because it is open to the public, Anybody can come in at any time who's never been here before. They don't understand what's going on and they want to draw attention to themselves and be disruptive. And it just kind of breaks my flow and it makes me uh, cautious, much more cautious. So in any event, uh, there are still repairs being done. 
They're not happening as often as they used to, um, but that's because I'm also very, very busy. I've got several computers here to finish building. I still have clients in my real job, which is taking care of my uh, business clients. And uh, every once in a while, a repair will roll in that I can shoot, and of course I will. There's no reason for me not to. It's great content. I love doing that content. But if it's piecemeal, if I'm just getting it once in a while, then that's something I keep for the members as a thank you for them. So hopefully that explains that. Okay, uh, let's see. Are we waiting on a restart now? That's what Thomas MacT says. Thank you for bringing that to my attention. Let me make this full screen so I can see it. Oh yes, finally we're ready for our restart. So that slow process was because of my internet connection. It's no indication of how fast or how slow the computer is. That's on me. And uh, the, the good news is the internet connection I use to broadcast these live videos is an entirely different internet connection with much greater bandwidth, much, much faster. I could not broadcast live with the other internet connection. It's Obviously, you saw how slow it was to download. Its upload is even worse. Andy says, would you consider doing a repair for non members. Well, first I need a, there's a couple things here, Andy. It's, it's not a matter of, of punishing anybody. It's about rewarding. It's about giving back to the people who give to me. It's also about having consent from somebody who has a repair that they will allow that to be shown in a live public video worldwide. You'd be surprised how many people are like, I'd rather not. Understand that there's nothing in it for them to allow me to do that. Um, if a person consents to allowing it, I'm more than happy to showing it uh, as a public video. However, if there is nothing rewarding members, then there's no incentive to become a member. So there's a delicate balance to walk there. If I have three repairs to do, I will obviously at least show one of them on the public side of things and probably do the other two on the private or members only side of things once again to incentivize people to become members and to reward those who have become members because without the members uh, I'd be lucky to get one video a month done YouTube revenues have fallen drastically I'm making less from YouTube this year than I was making three three years ago two or three years ago so despite the channel continuing to grow uh, the advertising money that YouTube brings in is divided by the number of creators they have that are monetized and the number of creators keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. So the money divided gets smaller and smaller and smaller. So I'm trying to find ways to keep the YouTube channel not only alive and active, um, but to also uh, take the stress off of me where I don't have any control over what YouTube's paying. I have no control over that. I can control membership fees. I can control sponsor fees. If I start taking on a lot of sponsors, then you're just watching infomercials. And that's what basically all the big tech channels do. And I don't want to do that. It's fine. Let them do it. I don't have a problem with it. So anyway, that's the situation I find myself in. And this has been working really well for me. So the answer to your question is yes. Yes, I would absolutely consider it if it's an option for me. Gerard Huff says, are members only videos live only, or can you review it later as a member? If you became a member today, you could watch all the members only videos, just like any other video on my channel. Yeah. Most of them are, are really intended as a look behind the scenes. What's coming up this week? What do I have going on? What are some of the challenges I'm trying to face? What are some of the repairs or stories that I'm not comfortable telling? publicly, but I will share with my members. Uh, and of course, members are worldwide and they're on different time zones. So our good friend Peter Laycock, for example, it's nighttime in Scotland and probably close to his bedtime. So he generally will watch these videos the next day, but he always, not always, but very often pops in and chat to say hello. And it's really super cool that he does that. And, um, I'm just trying to add value and again, show appreciation for the people who go above and beyond for me. 
in the meantime, these mini PCs, I am genuinely fascinated on how seemingly from out of nowhere, there's become a large variety of manufacturers and different models to choose from to the point where I'm starting to wonder if you're not a creator, and I don't necessarily mean a content creator like YouTube, but I mean a creator that you're, you're not using your PC to write a book or to edit photos or to create something, but you're just a consumer. Why would you need a full-size desktop computer anymore? Unless you're a gamer and you really want the high-end video resolution and frame rates, you can still do more or less the same thing on a mini PC, even to the extent of getting one with a Thunderbolt connection and putting an external desktop GPU and plugging it in. And you can do that, probably would still save you money. However, um, it's still going to be very expensive if you were going to do that. So what I'm trying to do, because of this shift in the industry, um, I'm trying to see what the caveats are, if there are any, to saving money, getting a smaller computer, takes up less space. They're designed to just run forever, right? So basically there's no moving parts except for the CPU fan. And um, I'm sure this little mini PC is probably faster than 80% of your computers from the people. 80% of the viewers watching this video probably have a computer slower than this and 30 times larger. Now, you can't even hear this computer. It's dead silent right now, but I'm sure if we start to really torture it, we'll hear that fan kick on just as you would with any computer. But we're not dealing with one of those Noctua DH15s that are this big. You know, it's a standard laptop style uh, cooler. And um, apart from upgrading the uh, solid state drive and the RAM and potentially the Wi Fi adapter, what other upgrades do people do, generally speaking? So, in that regard, I'm, I'm all on board with these mini PCs because they've become imperceptibly different. Uh, <laughs> you can't tell a difference for the equivalent mini PC to the equivalent desktop. But you can see the difference in your wallet. It's used to cost more to get everything smaller. But now, not only is it smaller, it also uses less power because we're using laptop designed CPUs, generally speaking, more often than not, which use less power. That also means they don't generate as much heat. And, you know, look, where you have heat, you're going to have wear. And will you, when you have wear, you will have eventual failure. So that's why I say these things uh, should last until they're no longer useful, but that's not a limitation or an issue with the electronics failing, but just that as the operating system continues to evolve and as our needs as users continue to evolve. Something like this that seems reasonably powerful today may not seem so powerful if we're all integrating AI processes into our own desktop computers, which can be very resource intensive. It's hard to say which which way things go. More and more things are moving to online. And so the emphasis really is on having a better internet connection and letting the big companies host all those big servers for the large computing tasks, offloading those large computing tasks off of our computers, requiring less power unless you're a creator, which most computer buyers are not creators. There's fewer typewriters than there are books. If you need a typewriter, if you're going to write a book. So somebody who reads books goes, I, I don't know why anybody would, would need a word processor or a typewriter. It doesn't make any sense to me. Well, because they're not a writer. But they don't think about what they're reading. What was it created with? It was created with a typewriter or a word processor. Without those, you wouldn't have the books. Or you'd have fewer books if you had to write them out. <laughs> All right, let's see. Uh, American Legends said desktops are still very useful in cloud servers, but not laptops so much. Well, that's completely untrue. You see, what ends up happening in the public 
is a lot of people have a very myopic vision, in my opinion, of anybody else's needs but their own. So when someone doesn't see the world around them, but instead focuses to see on what they choose to see, they come up with these completely false comments that have no evidence to back up what they're saying in reality. Laptops are selling like hotcakes. Tablets are selling like hotcakes. Smartphones and desktops. There's over 300 million computers sold every year worldwide. Worldwide, 300 million. So who's buying them? And that's a combination of desktops, laptops, tablets, smartphones. In fact, in that 300 million number, tablets and smartphones aren't even considered. We're just talking desktops and laptops. So um, the industry sort of speaks for itself as to what the general population wants. What an individual wants rarely represents what the population wants, sometimes. Um, but it depends on the individual, what their budget is and what their needs and expectations are. And it varies person to person. That's why when you go to a restaurant, you, you get a menu. You don't just get one thing and everybody eats the same, generally speaking. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see. We're back at the desktop. Let me get back to this here for a second. And let's go to Windows Update one more time. I just want to make sure that I've got all the updates. I'm a little curious why that, I swear it's 22H2 that's current, isn't it? If Microsoft is holding that back for some reason. Sometimes they'll hold back a big update if there's a known potential issue with something. No, nope, there it is, Windows 11 version 22H2. Now, I don't know why 22H2 wasn't already pre-installed uh, on this machine from Minisform. It's been out for a while now, and I'm a bit surprised at that, but it's a very, very important update. Uh, I, if, if I think all updates are important, these big updates, these are the ones that come out, well, they were biannual, I think now they're just annual. They're massive, and they're going to extend the life support cycle of your operating system. So 21H2 has an end of life, uh, I think in like two years. But when you put on 22H2, the end of life is like in four years, and by then there'll be a 23H2. That's why it's also important to keep up to date, not just for security feature enhancements and potential performance improvements, but also so that you continue to have a supported operating system to keep you safe online. Donald says AMD is doing great things as well. Oh, in his opinion, absolutely. AMD and Intel are wonderful choices, depending on what your needs are. AMD, generally speaking, is the choice of the consumer who is uh, wanting to support the little guy, right? They don't want to go to the big guy. Americans love underdogs, and if the underdog gets to be successful, they want to knock it off its perch to teach it a lesson. Bring it down to size. As long as you're, you know, the underdog, generally speaking, people are behind you, but the minute you succeed, people want to knock you off your perch. And I see this over and over and over again. Me personally, I don't really care if it's AMD or Intel. It's not like I'm going to use the computer any differently. But when I have to support a computer um, for the businesses, the problem I've had with AMD systems are the motherboards, which of course AMD doesn't make. Very rarely have a problem with the CPU itself. But uh, needless to say, or regardless, I build what my customers want. If a customer says, I want you to build me an AMD, I build them an AMD. If a customer says, I want you to build me an Intel, I build them an Intel. That's what my job is. So uh, this idea of picking a side is silly to me. It doesn't, doesn't make any sense why I would root for a faceless, soulless corporation. I just want to stay in business. And, and I want to make sure my customers are happy so they'll come back again. Tim Teal says that 22H2 was not installed on the Camrui either. It took a couple days to finally get it to install. Yeah, so I don't know if that's because they're using a system image that was created. Uh, obviously, it was created before 22H2 was released, but I don't know how long it is from the time the systems are manufactured to being 
the shipped out to the U.S. to a distribution warehouse, to then ending up at the consumer's final, final destination, that could be months. And if that's the case, then when this whole process started, say in this, this may have um, been sitting on a shelf a while, or could have been in transportation, since it's coming from Hong Kong here to the U.S. It's obviously going to take a while to get here. So I, I'm not going to. Um, I, I'm not going to say that's a fault on behalf of Mini Swarm. It's really being told to inform you on what to watch for when you buy a new computer. Pay attention to that because, as I mentioned, the updates are very, very important. Now, generally speaking, you will get the updates automatically anyway. However, I prefer to just go to the Windows Update uh, setting in the control panel or application in the control panel and get those updates manually so I'm not interrupted in my work with a little pop-up that says uh, your system's been updated and it'll restart during normal whatever hours you've got it set to restart at or you can restart it now. It just annoys me. <laughs> so by getting the updates on my own schedule, I'm being proactive instead of being reactive. When are Zen 4 mini PCs going to appear? You know, I don't, I don't know. Um, fair question. I think, like with Intel, the 13th gen laptop processors, Dell only last week, I think, released the 13th gen XPS laptop. And they only have one processor, as far as I know, one 13th gen processor. And, you know, 13th gen's been out since what, it's been six months? And just now, Dell finally has one 13th gen processor version of the XPS laptop available for sale. And uh, I'm an Intel guy myself. I prefer, for my own use, I prefer Intel. Um, but uh, nothing against AMD. I wouldn't, I don't, I don't have any particular issue with AMD. Because I sell more Intel, um, uh, Intel-based computers, I like to familiarize myself so that when the support calls come in, I don't have to Google it, look it up, and research it. And AMD has so many other chips, and they keep depreciating so quickly that it's very difficult for me to turn a profit with it as well as the support costs. So um, it's fine as a consumer-based machine. I don't, I don't, again, I don't have a, a particular issue with AMD. I do have some concern with some of the motherboards, and it's hard to know um, how they're going to last. You just have to buy one and wait it out, whereas with Intel, I have a tried and true, uh, you know, 13 generations of essentially the same architecture. So every time AMD introduces a new architecture, it's great to see them evolve. But at the same time, it opens up Pandora's box of what are these new problems we're going to have on a new platform and what's the reliability going to be, the build quality going to be. It keeps changing. And then because they're doing it so rapidly, the price of an AMD chip typically falls to 50%, 75%, 50% of what it originally retailed for just three months earlier. So as far as an investment goes, uh, they de AMD chips tend to depreciate rapidly, whereas Intel chips tend to hold their value much longer. But that can always change. That's just the marketplace. Um, for me, what's important is my customers get what they want and that they're happy with what they want and that I'm not losing money because they're calling with issues because we have some new platform. Um, but if a customer absolutely wants that new platform, I do warn them about the potential for increased need for support if they're prepared for that potential. And it, that's true if Intel came out with a new architecture. It would be the, it's, it's not just one way. We're on a 13th generation of the same architecture. So when there's a new architecture introduced, we run into new issues. Compatibility or, um, and, and compatibility could be anything from RAM compatibility to software compatibility, potentially. 
And Gear Offers become a supporter. Well, wonderful, Gear. Thank you for supporting the channel. Welcome into the Tech Club. Patrick Manning said Dell's XPS 13th Gen desktops are in the $3,500 to $4,000 range. They're very expensive, and there's only three or four models. Yeah, well, the XPS is sort of like their enthusiast level of computer. And the 13th Gen laptops that Dell is selling, the Dell XPS 13th Gen, if you spec those out with a, an 8 terabyte NVMe drive and 64 gigs of RAM, you're going to get about a price tag of around $5,000. It's a little too rich for my blood. The Dell XPS I'm still running today is an 8th Gen Intel. Okay, so today's video, though, of course, is about the mini PCs, but it does goes to show you how many of these you could buy for the price of one of those. Uh, of course, it's not going to have an 8 terabyte drive in it and 64 gigs of RAM at this price that we're talking about today, but you could you could totally do that and still be nowhere near that price. All right, let's take a look at, uh, oh, we're still, we're still downloading. Okay, let me look in the chat and see if there's other questions I can address here. We could Google the question regarding Zen 4. I could also reach out to my contact, uh, Phil, at Minisform to see if they've got anything in the works. Let's see, when will Zen 4 mini PCs appear? ASRock mini PCs with Zen 4 and Intel Raptor Lake are supported on the ECC database. So that's the, the database that verifies the um, RAM compatibility. But these aren't, these are pretty large though, what I'm looking at here. ER in the chat room says, do you think one day AMD will have better support for their CPUs? I don't think it's on AMD. I think it's on the motherboard manufacturers. When I have to fix an, uh, an AMD-based computer, more times than not, it's related. The problem is related to the motherboard, not the chip itself. So it, it's no dig on AMD. I, I don't know why it is. I don't know why I've seen so many issues with motherboards on the AMD platform. So when I talk about my preference of Intel versus AMD, I'm, I'm talking about not just the CPU. Because let's face it, if all I needed was the CPU, I'd have no issue. But the fact is the CPU needs a motherboard and that motherboard's gotta have a chipset and it's gotta have VRMs and it's gotta have cooling and it's gotta have proper power delivery and it's gotta have you know, compatibility with, in the BIOS for the RAM that we install and it's gotta have um, storage. It's it's all of these things together. And so by just simply focusing on one part that is dependent on all the other parts, if any one of the other parts doesn't hold up as well, then that individual part, I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to avoid that platform so that I don't lose my shirt and my reputation on support. But again, I do build whatever the customers want me to build. I want to emphasize that this is not this is not picking red or blue. This is not a fanboy choice. Um, I have costs involved in being in business. Every business has expenses, and support is one of the single largest expenses a computer company has. And of course, they don't want to offer support, and if they do, it's typically very limited because consumers these days can't seem to tell a difference between what support is and what tutoring is. When somebody calls support and says, I can't get my computer to do X, Y, Z, and we find out it's because the customer doesn't know how, that's private tutoring they're asking for. 
that's not a technical support problem. And so companies got tired of being abused in this way by the consumer because they were losing a lot of money. They would keep their tech support representatives on the phone too long trying to educate somebody over a, an issue that has to do with educating the user versus any product problem, you know, workmanship problem, a warranty related problem. So then the hold times get longer for everybody else wanting to call. So you have to hire more people to answer the phones or you get your customers upset that they're on hold too long and they just bad mouth you and say they won't buy your stuff ever again because when they needed you, you weren't there for them. I deal with that, right? If my customers don't get an answer within a reasonable period of time, it's very reasonable for them to take their business somewhere else. They've got things to do and they can't do them until they get the answer to their problem. But if the answer to their problem is an educational issue, you know, it's a fine line to walk to very gently tell the customer that's not a support issue. Um, in the meantime, if, if the streaming computer here to my right, if that was an AMD, you'd never know. For all you know, it could be. It's not like there's any difference in how the computer works. So to, to pick one over the other isn't, doesn't make any sense to me on an emotional level, which is what a lot of people do. They, they pick the underdog and I, I get it. I, I'm a big fan of the underdog. I see myself as an underdog here in YouTube and in life in general. But, uh, you know, if you make it, well, you know, when it was Bill Gates versus IBM, it, we we're all rooting for Bill Gates. And now because Bill Gates has ended up to be so successful, there's a lot of people that don't like him because of his success. It's very strange, the psychology of the world, and I don't quite understand it, but I can't deny that does seem to be a recurring pattern. Um, that being said, with these mini PCs, it doesn't matter to me if they're Intel or AMD. I so far have not been able to see any difference in reliability. However, uh, I haven't had them very long, so we just have to see how, as the years go by, if one platform seems more reliable than the other platform. Because I'm in business, the number of computers I see is far greater, far, far greater than that of the average ordinary computer user. So my sample data is much larger. And I feel like not only is my anecdotal experience um, going to tell me which platform is more reliable, it's going to show up in my bottom line and whether or not I can stay in business. So it's, it's very important to me that my customers remain happy so that they'll keep coming back. And if that's from selling them AMD, I'm selling them AMD. And if that's from selling them Intel, then I'm selling them Intel. Al Perez says, thanks to Carrie's links, I purchased Windows 10 Pro at a lower price and then updated to Windows 11 Pro for free. There you go. Mike Visions with a five pound contribution says, good day everyone and hope you're all in good health. Just a little tip for the channel, Carrie. Well, thank you, Mike, appreciate you as always. Uh, Jamie McGregor is now a member. Welcome to the Tech Club, Jamie. Rick Lakes contributed $10 in Super Chat. He says, happy Friday and St. Patrick's Day. Thank you, Rick. How you liking the, new, the mini PC, Rick? Raystar Man. Oh, we mentioned that one, said there's his late fee. Alan Lindus with a $7.77 super chat said, here's my late fee. <laughs> They're being silly. There are no late fees if you're new here and confused. Um, hopefully I got everybody there. I always like to give a shout out uh, to the folks that are generous and thoughtful enough to help support the channel in that way. So thank you guys. Thank you so much. Is there a Uncle Carrie's Windows 11 optimizer? There is not. Um, the Windows 10 optimizer does work on Windows 11, but how much of a difference it makes, I can't really tell you. It's not been thoroughly vetted out by me personally because I don't have any Windows 11 computers. When my customers start switching to Windows 11 and I have to support it, when I see that day approaching, which is probably going to be starting January of 2024, so no, January of 2025, so 
two and a half years from now, year and a half from now, I will probably start putting Windows 11 on everything so I can stay a step ahead of my customers and answer any questions or problems that they have making that transition to Windows 11. Because that'll give us 10 and a half months, or gives me 10 and a half months from January in, of 2025 until October 14th of 2025 to get up to speed because October 14th is the cutoff date for the life, the, the support of Windows 10, unless Microsoft extends it, which I don't expect they will. And that's plenty of time. That's a long way off. So it's, I have no anxiety or concern about it as of now. As we approach that, it will be worth my time and effort to invest in uh, updating the Windows 11 optimizer, unless uh, Windows 12 comes out between then and now, which is possible. There's a lot of rumors. They're just rumors. But if it happens, then I would be wasting my time on anything for Windows 11 because we would just leapfrog from 10 over to 12. So again, by waiting to see how the market and what Microsoft does, uh, how the market responds, Windows 11 has not been widely adopted. It's still relatively got a small percentage of, of desktops that it's installed on or computers that it's installed on. It's not making Microsoft too happy and they're getting more and more aggressive about trying to convince people to install it. If they have a PR problem with Windows 11, it can only be solved by rebadging it as Windows 12. That's why despite fixing all the issues with Windows Vista, they, Microsoft could not get past the public perception of it not being good, even when the issues were fixed. And so by saying, okay, well now it's Windows 7, it's convincing the public it's new and fresh when it's essentially just built upon <laughs> Windows Vista, a lot of it. Uh, and then when Windows 8 didn't do well, and then 8.1, they fixed a lot of the issues. They just, once the public is soured, it's hard to convince them to give it another try. So then it's, okay, Windows 10 then, right? Which is nothing more than really Windows 8, but it's uh, got some significant um, interface changes. But the core of the Windows operating system hasn't changed much since Windows 7. That was the last major, major big OS improvement and everything else is sort of built on and expanded and built around that core. David Nation says the optimizer works fine on Windows 11. Yes, yeah, so yeah, it does work on Windows 11. As I said, I've, I've run it on this machine and I've run it on other machines. I just don't know how much benefit there is to it. I know what the benefit was on Windows 10. I don't know what the benefit is on Windows 11 yet. Okay, let's see how we're doing on this. Is it still downloading that? Yeah, it's still downloading that, okay. All right, so again, while we're waiting on the download, if you have any questions, comments, anything you wanna talk about, we'll do that while we wait. I thought I had done all the updates off, off camera, so apparently I didn't. So I apologize for that. I was trying to avoid going through this waiting process and I don't want to review a product that isn't up to date. I don't feel the, the results of the tests will be accurate until all the updates are put on. Brian says he's got two PCs with Windows 11. Sure, uh, a lot of people have Windows 11. It just doesn't make up um, a very large percentage of desktop operating systems. Uh, that's not to say nobody has it. Certainly don't, don't imply that from what I said. There's just not as many people have Windows 11 that have Windows 10. So Windows 10 is the sort of the 800 pound gorilla and um, there's no reason for anybody to upgrade to Windows 11 so far as I can tell. There's also no reason if you have Windows 11 to downgrade to Windows 10. They're nearly identical except for how they look. There's some minor changes, but for most people, um, those minor uh, features that are added in Windows 11, your average consumer isn't going to benefit from them. 
Microsoft seems to feel otherwise. And of course, enthusiasts will often feel otherwise. But your average consumer, you know, they don't want to have to relearn where everything got moved around. And um, putting any pressure on them to upgrade to Windows 11 this early, when they have until October of 2025, seems like a lot of anxiety and fear mongering over nothing. So um, if you buy a new computer, it likely will come with Windows 11, and that's fine. I wouldn't downgrade it to Windows 10. And if I have a Windows 10 computer, I would not upgrade it to Windows 11 until sometime in or after January of 2025. Patrick Hussaw said he's got one of each, a Windows 10 and a Windows 11. Hey, that's good. That keeps you uh, familiar with both operating systems. Nothing wrong with that. Patrick Doyle says, watching your video live is making me feel better after testing positive for COVID. Well, I'm glad I can keep you distracted and entertained as you write out the, what is it, two weeks? You got to sit through it, but uh, hope you'll feel better soon. And let's see. Yeah, our download is painfully slow today, unfortunately. Rick Lakes mentions the mini PC he received came with Windows 11. Mm -hmm. That was the one we reviewed here. The, uh, is it the Ace Magician or Cam Rui? Most of the new computers being sold today are going to come with Windows 11. It's a contract Microsoft more or less forces the hands of the manufacturer because they want the... Uh, to increase their market share of Windows 11. So they sort of force it on to the manufacturers, whether they like it or not, for better or for worse. But just because that's what's coming with new computers doesn't mean there's any incentive for you to have it on your existing computer. If you put Windows 11 on, it's fine. I'm not suggesting you should avoid it. But at the same time, I don't see any benefit from having it. So. You know, if it's something to do to occupy your time, have fun. But it's nothing you, that's as important as like these updates. These are important. Whether or not you upgrade from 10 to Windows 11 is not important and likely won't make any difference in the operation or cap capabilities of your computer until October 14th of 2025, at which point you're going to need to stay supported to be secure online. And then that will be the reason. Unless... Unless Microsoft comes up with an update that enables Windows 11 to do something that Windows 10 doesn't already do. For that, I'm st we're all still waiting. Paul says he notices more problems with Chrome rather than Windows 11. Yeah, sure. And of course, every application gets updated, whether you're doing a Photoshop or Adobe Acrobat, QuickBooks, Quicken, they always get updated and they always keep changing. People tend to prefer what they're familiar with. All right, I'm going to just take another look here. 89% downloaded. So I continue to bide my time. Uh, let's see. I want to go back over to Minis Forum's website. And I want to see what they're boasting about here. So we're going to switch over on OBS to my window capture. And this is all about this computer, the UM773. This is the AMD Ryzen 7 7735HS. That's a 7th gen, or a Ryzen 7000, sorry, Ryzen 7000 series CPU with the RDNA 2 architecture with the built-in graphics, the AMD Radeon 680M. So if you're a gamer and you're going to use onboard graphics, you, AMD's onboard graphics are much better than Intel's in regard to gaming, but they're still built-in graphics. So for what it is, it's actually quite impressive, but it's not really comparable to a proper discrete graphics card. 
It does have USB 4. Oh, I didn't realize that. So a USB 4 port, which can transfer up to 40 gigabits per second of data, that's impressive. Uh, mentions their heat efficiency, or sorry, high efficiency heat dissipation and how they've designed it. If we continue to scroll down through the website here to explore their images, which are nice close-up images, we can also see that they talk about the CPU having eight cores and 16 threads with a frequency of 3.2 gigahertz that can go turboing up to 4.75, which is insane. And has a DDR5. Oh, that's, that's good. I didn't realize it had DDR5. So here they're comparing the 6000 series Ryzen to the 7000 series. In general, from one generation of chip, whether it's Intel or AMD, to the next generation, you're looking at about an average of a 10% increase. So an, uh, an annual upgrade isn't really necessary. After about three, four, five years, that's why you start noticing the difference in the upgrade. This talks a little bit about the integrated graphics, a 680M based on RDNA 2 architecture. It shows it's 225% better than the 5800 so going back uh, two generations of chip on um, the GPU side of things, massively a big improvement there. It says the UM773 Lite offers satisfying results on productivity and entertainment. Finishing office routines, watching films, and playing games are easier than ever. Yeah, with those specs, that certainly sounds about right to me. The UM773 Lite continues the upgrade-friendly design, the dual SO DIMM slots for DDR5 and M.2 2280 PCI 4.0 solid-state NVMe drive, and an available 2.5-inch slot for SATA 3.0 uh, storage. Uh, they're calling it HDD, but it could also be um, solid-state or mechanical is something you can add to expand your storage, but you wouldn't want to boot from that. This will support up to 64 gigs of RAM. And there's a breakout of what it looks like inside. The laptop style cooler here with liquid metal as the thermal conductor between the top of the CPU and the bottom of the heatsink, which is how they're able to control those temps without cranking the fan up so loud. And then you can see here where the optional two and a half inch storage drive can go. They've got a mechanical drive in here, but a solid state drive will work as equal as, as easily in the same. And then the two RAM slots above that. The thermal system allows the UM773 Lite to run at full load with relatively low temperatures and noise. The upgraded craftsmanship improves the stability and efficiency of liquid metal cooling. The liquid metal is able to transmit heat quickly. Furthermore, the smart fan with 120 blades can run at high RPM at a lower noise level. That's showing you how the, where the cold air or the blue arrows is pulled into the machine. And then the red arrows is showing the output path of the air. It's always important that the air flows in one direction. And in this case, having and I've mentioned this on desktops, having a rear case fan or a, uh, an exhaust fan at the top of the case, you're still moving the air essentially from front to back. That's what's important. It also draws cool air in as it's shown here from the bottom. And I think I might have this thing upside down. No. That's right. So the hot air, yeah, I can feel the hot air coming out of the top of it. Ah, that's why they say it's got 120 blades. That makes sense now.
The uh, USB 4 port offers data transfer speed, as I previous, previously mentioned, at 40 gigabits per second, but it also supports an external display up to 8K at 60 hertz. It's pretty cool. And it also supports a portable monitor, meaning that it can provide power to the portable monitor as well as the display all on that one cable. So if you used all the HDMI and the USB 4, you could have three 4K displays running at 60 hertz simultaneously. Oh, that's a 2.5 gigabit LAN Ethernet port on the uh, on the machine here. I didn't realize that was 2.5 gig. That's becoming more and more standard on motherboards nowadays. So apparently this is not a reset button like I thought it was. It says it's a dynamic microphone. So it's got a microphone built into it. Huh. There's length and width at 128 millimeters and height at 48.2 millimeters. And this is all your fine print. And it's a brand, it's a relatively new product, so that's why you're not seeing any reviews on it yet. And again, this is at Minis Forum's website, which of course, you can uh, peruse through, uh, in my case, the U.S. warehouse to see what options are available. You'll see that Minis Forum has a lot of very unique designs. It's not like they're just changing the internals. They're changing the enclosure, different size enclosures, different color enclosures, different heights, thinner enclosures that perhaps may not have room for a two and a half inch drive if that's nothing you need or you need more USBs. Uh, and you want them all right next to each other. Lots of variation in design to meet the needs, the individual needs of, of the purchaser, of the consumer, as well as uh, the needs including budget. There may be models available in Europe that are not available in the US and of course vice versa for various reasons. So make sure if you're looking to buy one in your country that you're looking at the right warehouse, basically, of what's being sold in your country. All right, let me see if I can go back now to check on our computer here. Looks like it's still, still downloading. Wonderful. All right. So I'll go back over to chat and see what you guys are talking about. If we have any other questions I can answer for you. Gary says that's a pretty powerful machine for the size. And for the price, you're getting a lot for the money. I mean, I challenge you to try and put together something with the same specification or nearing the same specification, uh, including the cost of the operating system, the RAM, the storage, the cooler, the case, the power supply, the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, um, and of course the CPU, and add it all up at what your cost would be from buying it from any retailer you choose. Then you've got the labor to put it all together. So it's really a great value for what you're getting. Brian Larson says it's basically equivalent to a laptop. Um, in many ways, mini PCs have always been equivalent to a laptop. And laptops are gonna have batteries and they're gonna have a monitor and they're gonna have a keyboard and a mouse or a touchpad. They're gonna have speakers. Um, so, you know, there's, Laptops are really designed that you can be like at a coffee shop and bring your computer with you and open it up at, at your Starbucks or whatever and do whatever you want to do. With a mini PC, you, you'd have to plug it in somewhere, right? You'd need a monitor, you'd need a keyboard, you'd need a mouse. You'd probably want to bring headphones. Well, either way, even with a laptop, to be courteous of people around you, you'd want headphones on if you're listening to anything. So 
as far as upgradability, the upgrades are very similar to a laptop, yes. Andy Kane says they have a very good selection on the site. Uh, yeah, that's why I wanted to show it. There's price ranges from very, very budget friendly, mid range, and of course the high end enthusiast levels of PCs. Uh, you know, you could start at under $200 and go over $1,000, depending on what your needs are, right? How much computing power do you need? How much RAM do you need? Or how much RAM potential do you need? So some of the cheaper ones are limited to just 16 gigs of RAM. And for most consumers, that's fine. If you're more of uh, somebody who's uh, more of a power user, then you might feel like that's not quite enough. You want the system to be more responsive because you're going to be running multiple things simultaneously. And more RAM is going to help the computer become more responsive. Well, it's multitasking. But if you're not multitasking much, 16 gigs is uh, fine for most people today. Now, unless you're gaming, and they do have higher end machines for that purpose, this machine can be used for gaming. The onboard graphics are very good. It's still not fair to compare it to a proper discrete graphics card, but I also wouldn't turn my nose up at it. I mean, they've got, they're promoting Chromebooks now for cloud gaming, which is, in my opinion, is, you might as well game on your cell phone. Um, and for what they're charging for these Chromebooks, for they're, they're labeling, the, labeling them as gaming Chromebooks, you might as well just buy a gaming laptop, quite frankly, um, or a gaming mini PC, one that's specifically designed for that. And this, as I mentioned, it's sort of at the, at the high end of the mid-range or the low end of the high range, depending, it's kind of straddling that line. And uh, playing the games at 1080, most titles should run just fine on this. especially if you turn a lot of the other settings down. So, and the reason I, I've i asked Vinny's Forum to send me the PC is because I've lately been focusing on the inexpensive mini PCs, the ones that are $200 or less. And I can tell you, looking at the commissions from Amazon, the number of people buying those $200 mini PCs far far outreaches the number of people buying literally any other type of mini PC. So I think as of last count, there was around 60 of those that were sold at the $200 range. And I think three or four that were sold um, at the 400 and above range. So that's obvious, right? People don't have as much money, most people, and they want to get the best value for their buck, and they're not gamers. Gaming is an expensive luxury. It's not something anybody has to have. And um, there's a lot of profit for the manufacturers in selling gaming machines. Obviously, they don't make much money selling a $200 computer. So as we ramp up the power and the power consumption, the technical requirements also are more demanding, and they're not as, they're not as cheap to make. Then on top of that, if you put the word gaming on it, you can add a little bit more profit margin into it as a manufacturer, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. You want the manufacturer to stay in business, I would hope. So, um, yeah, just set your expectations accordingly to what you're buying. Don't expect to get a Rolls Royce if you're buying a Chevy. They're very different vehicles at very different price points. That doesn't mean the Chevy's bad. Uh, let's see, okay, now we're installing 22H2. So it has downloaded, and this install shouldn't take very long. Luke Greeny says uh, he's been running an Ace Magician CK10 with Plex for streaming, TV and movies, and it's been rock solid. I've yet to see it buffer and he's really in, really loving the mini PC. So again, you know, that's a prime example of somebody who has a very specific need, and especially when it comes to like a home theater PC that you don't necessarily want something big or distracting uh, in interfering with the watching the movie or the TV show. You want the emphasis to be on the screen, what's being displayed, not on the equipment. Um, not to mention the amount of room it takes up. So having a mini PC as a home theater PC makes a lot of sense 
And the fact that you've got a full Windows operating system on it means you can also use it for other things besides home theater. You can break out your keyboard and mouse and sit on the couch and browse the web and bring up YouTube and do all that in the comfort of the living room on the big screen TV without having to have this large tower, which could be, you know, with a lot of RGB distracting, it could be loud with fans. So the mini PC is very, very ideal as a home theater PC, but it can also be very ideal as a work, a workplace PC because, um, in the workplace, people tend to put their towers on the floor in their chairs, which have wheels on them. They constantly run into them and they set coffee on top of them and they do all kinds of things they shouldn't be doing that leads to problems that they wouldn't have if it was just a mini PC sitting off on the desk and uh, they'd have more room for their feet or more, if they put their tower on their desk, they'd have more room on their desk for work. So they're wonderful in many different um, traditional uses that people are accustomed to using a desktop PC for. I imagine businesses will continue with desktop PCs in one shape or form or another. Home users, on the other hand, will probably continue to downsize because most home users aren't creating anything. They're just consuming. So they don't need that expense and they don't need that big footprint of a machine. And uh, they may not even need Windows 11, to be honest. They could probably get by with more of a Chromebook style of OS or Chrome OS. Once again, if they're not creating, if all they're doing is consuming, then that's going to be much cheaper uh, to purchase, easier to maintain, and uh, less risk of viruses and things taking anything important. And, you know, while this is installing, I have yet to hear this fan crank up. It is dead silent. Sixty-four percent on our install here. Ron Barnish updates us on his monitor situation. He bought a no-name brand monitor and had some issues with it. So he's updating us that he has returned that monitor. And he just purchased an LG monitor, a name brand monitor. And he says it just arrived and he's waiting till the stream is over before he hooks it up. I suspect you're going to be much, much happier with a name brand monitor uh, than these no name brand, super cheap, super inexpensive monitors that you can find at places like Amazon. There's a lot of manufacturer names coming out of China I've never heard of before. They're not necessarily manufacturers, but just buyers that are slapping their name on something that some other manufacturer is making. So you might have six different manufacturers all selling the exact same monitor and the support is very questionable. The quality can be very questionable. Since the monitor is such an important part of your experience, we're using our keyboard, mouse, and monitor to communicate with our machine. It's definitely not something, in my opinion, that you should go cheap on. People don't replace their monitors very often. So if you intend to have a monitor for the next 10 years, bite the bullet, buy a good one. Doesn't have to be the most expensive, but I certainly wouldn't buy the cheapest. I might buy the cheapest name brand or the cheapest one that has the size and features I want, but I also want a manufacturer that I know is going to support me if I need it. So sticking with name brand manufacturers is, is a great peace of mind on your purchase. It makes it less risky. When you want to save money and buy some inexpensive thing from some manufacturer you never heard of, you are gambling and that's okay. Just know that. <laughs> so as long as you accept your risk to save a few dollars, I don't have a problem with it. I have a problem with people who aren't aware. They think they're getting the exact same thing for less money, and you're not. There's something to be said about support and peace of mind if there is a problem. And ironically, 
the companies that offer the best support, in my experience, are the ones that have the, the best reliability, that the least, the better the support offering is from the manufacturer, the less likely you'll need it. I guess that's what I've been trying to say. Uh, but good. Well, thank you for following up with us, Ron, and let us know how that LG works out for you. This is a painfully slow update. Uh, yeah, well, it's a, it's a big, major, major update. Anytime you see those, you know, 22H2 or what'll be 23H2 or 23H1, if such a thing comes out, these are big, big, massive operating updates that are the equivalent of what we used to call service packs. If you recall, if you've been using computers, Windows-based computers for a while, you remember those big service packs. That's all the previous updates for the last year or two years, all jammed into one big update. And of course, then they re-release the new image file so that when you install Windows, you're getting an installation that already has that embedded into it. So you don't have to go through all this every time. But it is important, it is free, and it is absolutely uh, uh, highly recommended that you don't put it off. Again, I prefer to be proactive. I don't want to be reactive and have to deal with something because I procrastinated getting the free update because it took too long. Kurt Schlegel has become a supporter. Right on, Kurt. Welcome into the Tech Club. There's our friend Winston Liu joining us from Canada, contributing $2.20 Canadian. John P. wants to know if I have any ideas for a laptop for web browsing, Facebook, and light games. Well, it depends on what your budget is and what size screen you want and if you'll be running it off the battery. Some people buy laptops and have no intention of ever unplugging them. So it really depends on those answers. Uh, in general, I stick with name brands like Dell. HP even has some decent laptops. I, I know I pick on HP a lot because on the lower end of things, in order to reach those really cheap prices, HP does some things that I, I despise, but that's how they're cost cutting to get the price down. So if you have a decent budget for a decent laptop, um, I would stick with a name brand laptop. Of course, the size of the screen is, and whether or not it's a touch screen is going to be a major influencer of what that machine is going to cost. Okay, still doing our update here. Nearly there, we're at 90% folks. And while these updates do take time, they afford us a little break in the content so we can interact with each other. Without the interaction, it might as well be TV because you don't interact with your television or traditional cable television. So in this way, we have the ability to talk to one another since I'm live, and it makes this a very unique platform to engage with the community. So I like to use these opportunities where we're forced to wait. Uh, despite my attempt to try to avoid this, uh, I've been very distracted this week with a lot of work. And uh, apparently when I thought I was done with this, I wasn't paying close enough attention and that's why we find ourselves here. But on the bright side, it also means there's more time for us to engage. Sarge Tech wants to know if I have any advice on using trim in Windows 10 and dis disabling the swap file. Well, I do have a video about virtual memory. And um, basically my rule of thumb is the engineers who designed the computer, who designed the storage, who designed the operating system, 
for the most part, these are highly educated, in many cases, Ivory League educations. And they undergo a lot of quality control testing. And they have mathematically and scientifically calculated the best settings for the general public, for the general population to have, for everyone to have a good user experience. Now, the minute you go in there and start modifying things, what most people don't realize is there can be long-term consequences later on that you will often, or the end user will often blame Microsoft for. But it turns out it was something the end user changed that they did months ago or even over a year ago that's now coming back to bite them on the butt. So take disabling a swap file. If you set a hard level of a swap file or if you disable it, that might you might think you're outsmarting those highly educated engineers when in fact what you're really doing is tricking yourself. What ends up happening is what I see, and I see this over and over again, these enthusiasts start messing around in Windows settings thinking they can get more performance out of it. And a lot of times by making some of these suggested changes that people are hearing about on YouTube or uh, reading on blogs, they do see an improvement in performance. And they go, wow, look at that, I've outsmarted Microsoft. And then what they use the computer for evolves. Maybe they start video editing. Maybe they buy a scanner and they want to start scanning a bunch of their old photos. Or maybe, I don't know, they get into photo editing or something else, some other interest. And when they go to um, edit a video, the machine crashes. And they have to call support from the manufacturer. The editing software, they can't figure out what's going on. They tell you to call Microsoft. Of course, getting through to anybody on Microsoft, good luck with that. So you might go into the forums, Microsoft support forums, and ask some of the MVPs there for free voluntary help. And what almost is universal is when you ask for support, the assumption is that you haven't done something to the operating system to cause that. And you might have forgotten that you did it. So the end solution is something's wrong with your Windows operating system, reinstall it. So you do the reinstall and everything works and you go, oh, that Microsoft, you're such junk. But it was you, you caused it. You should have left the swap file alone. Let it self adjust, leave it alone. It's designed to be optimized for how you use the computer. And since the way you use the computer is likely going to change as your interests change, the swap file can adjust to those changes. But if you remove the swap file or you make the swap file a fixed size, the benefits of that have been lost as far as fragmentation goes because solid state drives don't experience any degradation in performance due to fragmentation. Hard disk drives do, although not so much these days, but even still, it's, re it's redundant to defragment a solid state drive. It, it absolutely serves no purpose. However, well, I will say data is easier to recover if it's not fragmented on a failed drive. I've only seen two failed SSDs so far. I started installing them in 2013, 2012. Maybe I've seen three, three bad solid state drives. That doesn't mean it doesn't happen. Of course it happens, but that's what backups are for anyway. You always have backups. With regards to the trim command, Windows is automatically doing that for your solid state drive. There's no reason for you to have this line of thinking that comes from the days of Windows XP or Windows 95, where the end user had to do a lot of maintenance to keep the machine optimized. Windows 10 optimizes itself and now the opposite happens. When people try to get ahead of that, they end up, in most cases, needing to call somebody like me to fix the problem they cause. And it can be very difficult for us to try and fix it because they don't tell us they did that. They don't tell us they made a change most end users would never make, such as an end user typically doesn't even know what a swap file is, let alone what it does and how to change it and why. So from the technician's point of view, 
we're not even going to look at the swap file. We're not even going to look at those settings. It doesn't occur to us that your system's crashing because you have done this to yourself. So I highly recommend, if you want a system to be reliable and operate with peak efficiency, leave the default settings in that regard to a swap file. Let Windows automatically adjust it. It's set that way for a very important reason. And, you know, what you do with your computer is your business. I'm just giving you advice as a professional technician. Let Windows maintain itself. Windows 10 and Windows 11 maintain themselves. There is no reason for any PC utility software. In most cases, it will give you no benefit. And in some cases, it will cause problems. So if you have a problem and you're trying to solve that problem by disabling the swap file or by using the trim command, I want to know what the problem is you're trying to fix versus asking me a question about making a change to the operating system like that without giving me a good reason why. What do you think that's going to do for you? So as a technician, if you told me what it was you were trying to accomplish, I could answer that for you. And my answer will never be to fix the swap file, as a, you know, fix it at a fixed size or to disable it entirely. That will never be the answer to your problem. It is, however, the solution to undo what you did to a future problem if you do that. So if you understand those risks and you want to do it anyway, have at it. it don't bother me any. Um, but just remember what I said. So when it happens, and it will happen, you'll then go, oh, now I get what he said. Sometimes people just don't get things until it happens to them. And then suddenly they realize, like the light comes on. And that's okay. You know, we all have to learn somehow. But uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of real flaky advice on the internet. And a, a lot of the stuff we used to do back in the day, we did for a very good reason. But we don't, we're not back in the day anymore. So why are we still carrying these uh, practices forward when they're no longer necessary? That's, that's my opinion on it. Now, we're going to finish this update. I'm gonna grab a cold Gatorade. If you have other questions for me, please ask in the chat room. And then I'll run some tests on this and we'll see how fast the internal storage is, the solid state drive. And uh, we can run Prime 95 and see how the cooling is. Then of course, if you have any other questions for me in, with regards to this, uh, the Mini Swarm PC or PCs in general, technology in general, I'll do my best to provide an answer for you. William Dawson says hello from Florida. Steve Smith says, when I realize my cursor isn't working like it should or the web pages aren't loading like they should, I restart my computer. It's always the first question tech support will ask is if you've turned it off and back on again. There's a reason for that. Sometimes that's what fixes it. Um, so do Restart your computer if you're having any problems before you go asking for help. You'd be surprised how often that fixes the problem and how amazing Windows 10 and Windows 11 are. It's self-healing. Okay, now we're rebooting. We'll see what our boot time is here. Oh, well, that doesn't count. <laughs> we can't calculate the boot time when we're still installing updates. Gary, do you use registry cleaners? Uh, once again, in Windows XP days, heck, even in Windows 7 days, but not anymore. Registry cleaners will benefit nobody. There is no reason to use a registry cleaner. If you use a registry cleaner and it doesn't damage your computer, or at least it hasn't caused any damage you're aware of yet, it also didn't make anything any better. It might say you've got all these errors in the registry. Do you want to fix them? And I challenge you. 
This is an open challenge to anybody. Show me a performance difference after cleaning any registry on a Windows 10 or Windows 11 computer. Basically, what you're going to find out is it makes zero difference in your boot time or in your software loading times. Zero. I mean completely and totally immeasurable. And it is the it is a very common source for computer problems to occur that you never had before. And they may not occur immediately. They could occur six months from now. And once again, people will blame Microsoft. They'll blame the software when it was themselves running a utility that shouldn't have been run, that didn't solve any issue. I do not understand why anybody would take a perfectly good computer and start messing around with internal and very complex settings of which there are hundreds of thousands of registry settings. And they often can count on one another throughout the entire registry tree. And the end result is you have a computer that's not any faster, it's not any more secure, and might end up having a problem with some software you install in the future that needs a registry setting that you have removed. And why did you do it? That's where I'm stuck. I don't understand why somebody would take a perfectly good working computer and damage it. Sometimes the logic is I'm making it better, but what was wrong with it? What, what was your complaint? And in many cases, what I'm hearing is I didn't have any complaint. I'm just trying to get more out of it. Okay, for what reason? What do you use it for that you need to get more out of it? Maybe you need to invest in more RAM or a faster storage drive. But it's nothing you're going to click on with the mouse or the keyboard or some utility software that's going to resolve that without potential consequences, serious potential consequences, which may not reveal themselves ever. In other words, there could be damage that you've caused to your computer that six or six months or a year from now, you start having a problem with some update to a piece of software or a new type of software you've never used before. And you never find the solution other than to reinstall Windows. Anybody who's ever had to reinstall Windows especially we're talking about Windows 10 and Windows 11, generally has screwed the computer up themselves. It's not something that they're a victim of from some outside party, unless it's a virus. But even then, they did it to themselves by clicking on something they should have not clicked on, opening an attachment they shouldn't have opened, uh, that sort of thing. They're voluntarily causing their own harm. And then they're blaming it on Windows. So. If you leave Windows as it is, and you have a problem you're trying to resolve, I would love the opportunity to help you resolve it. But if the questions, if what you've done is you've just put me right in the middle of something, can I turn off the trim? Can I run the trim command? Why? See, you've put me in the middle, but you haven't told me why. What is it you're trying to fix or improve? And why are you trying to fix it or improve it? Because when I have the goal in mind that you have, I will probably recommend you go a completely different route to get there. Probably. So without the context of the purpose of the question, my default answer is leave it alone unless you enjoy the challenge of fixing something later because it is risky and you can avoid the risk you could say to me, I've run registry cleaners and I've never had a problem. That's fine. You could also say to me, you go into casinos and you've never lost. What's your point? You're luckier than most. It doesn't mean that everybody has that same experience. So what ends up happening is it encourages this behavior until something happens. And it will. Give it enough time. There will be consequences. If you don't do it at all, there are zero consequences. <laughs> so while one holds risk, the other one holds zero risk. And regardless of how much risk, it's irrelevant because zero is zero. <laughs> and why would you put any risk at all unless there was some return on that to make it worth risking? That's my perspective on it. Let's take a look now one more time over at Windows Update to see if we have 
updates to um, 22H2. And there are a few more updates here. So we'll grab those. These shouldn't take very long. Wow, I don't even have to reboot after those. Okay, now everything is up to date and we should see 22H2 on here. Yes, everything looks good now. Windows 11 Pro, and it should show that it's activated. Yes, activation state is active. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So I'm gonna reboot just so we clear the memory out and we'll start running some tests here. That's why I was rebooting. See those updates? We're still needing to um, complete on the restart, even though it wasn't required. I don't want to run any benchmarks until I know all the updates are applied. Starshine mentions uh, that these registry cleaners that are removing abandoned or orphaned registry entries, those registry entries aren't hurting anything. You could have tens of thousands of them and it will make zero difference in performance because of how the folks at Microsoft have engineered the operating system so much more efficiently. Now, back in the day, a bloated registry could cause a real serious system performance issue as well as system reliability problems, but that was back in Windows XP, Windows 95 days. Uh, going all the way up, I'd say till about Windows 7 is when that stopped. So there won't be any performance benefit for you to remove those orphaned registry entries. It's just a way for programmers, for third-party manufacturers who have system utilities that did have a purpose in previous versions of Windows. They're trying to stay in business by convincing you their software still has relevancy and it, telling you it doesn't. There is not a system utility that exists that you need in Windows 10 or 11. It's all built into Windows now. And... Windows does it on its own. You don't have to do anything. Lugrinia says, I think everyone is guilty of monkeying around with their PCs and messing them up beyond fixing. It's time for a clean install. Yeah. Oh, oh, I don't have a problem with that. It's a great way to learn. But I just want you to have reasonable expectations. If you're going to do something, I want you to fully understand what the potential consequences are. And if you want to do it anyway and you accept that, I'm good with it. It's the people who act blindsided. Like, I had no idea that when I did this six months from now, it was going to create a problem. A lot of the websites and YouTube content that recommends making optimization changes don't warn the viewer against the, con the potential consequences that can you know, rear their ugly heads at the most inopportune time. Take a look at something here. The, um, the little search highlights, the little graphics that appear in the search, it really annoys a lot of people, myself included. And I've shown how you can easily remove that on Windows 10 with a right click of the mouse button on this taskbar. On Windows 11, it's a different process, and I was just Googling to remind myself that we want to go into uh, privacy and security and then into permissions to turn off the, sh the show search highlights. And what I'm referring to is 
stalling as I'm trying to make my screen bigger so I can see again. Are these little, well, today they're clover leaves down here for St. Patrick's Day, right down here. I want this graphic gone. So on Windows 10, it's, it's just a right click into the taskbar settings. But in Windows 11, you've got to go into the settings, the little cog wheel here, and then you're going to go, going to go under privacy and security. And then under search, Did I just go right past it? Let me go, let me go look at that series of events. It's uh, search permissions is where the show search highlights option is under. So privacy and security and then search permissions. So it's a slightly different process to deactivating that little cartoon icon that gets changed on your desktop here, on your search bar. So search permissions is right here. And then we wanna look for, so I was in the right place. Show search highlights, that's where it is. We turn this off and you're gonna see the little cartoons that appear down here are gonna go away. Just like that, and that puts it back to the normal search bar. And that's how you do that in Windows 11. I need to make a, a short how-to video on that for Windows 11, since the one I've made is only for Windows 10. But it's very simple, it's just different. Uh, let's take a look at Crystal Disk Mark and see what kind of performance we're getting out of the solid state drive included on this mini PC. We'll run all the tests and see how they perform. This takes a couple minutes, and once again, I'll go back over to the chat and we can continue our discussions while we wait for the results. Pat Lynch says, do I furnish computers, do I furnish Windows 11 Pro if I bear, if I Yes, you have to provide your own Windows. It doesn't necessarily have to be Windows 11, Windows 10 or Windows 11, uh, either one. But yes, you have to provide your own operating system because a bare bones computer has no storage device. So there's no way for them to include an operating system. There's nothing to put an operating system on. And without any memory, there's no RAM for the operating system to operate within. So you need to provide your own storage, your own RAM, and your own operating system, whether that's uh, Windows or Linux. So there, there, a bare bones computer traditionally does not have storage and therefore does not come with an operating system. I think you might be misinterpreting what bare bones means. Bare bones often refers to a computer that you provide the RAM and the storage and the operating system, typically. It's a motherboard, it's a CPU, it's a case, it's a power supply, it's everything but the RAM and storage in most cases, which of course means you have to provide your own operating system. American Legend says, I've heard Windows 11 is very unpopular with people. It doesn't matter what people like. That's, that's irrelevant. Microsoft has to answer to an industry and they have to answer to shareholders and they have to keep moving forward or be left behind through a competitor. So if people don't like it, it's too bad. Um, the reality is Microsoft controls it and you uh, voluntarily choose if you want to use it or not. Nobody forces it on you. There are other operating systems such as Linux that you can often uh, used as a replacement for most Windows computers. You do not have to use Windows. There is no requirement for you to do so. So Microsoft doesn't really care if you use Windows or not. They honestly don't care. Microsoft is answering to businesses and the needs of businesses. That's where the bulk of income comes from Microsoft. 
So consumers kind of get what's left over, right? This is what you're going to get. And if that's not good enough for you, you can choose to use a different operating system. And I don't know that saying that people don't like Windows 11, you're just <laughs> sort of coming to that conclusion because it aligns with what you want to hear. In all likelihood, that's just human behavior. It's not just me, it's everybody else. But Microsoft is having a difficult time, not necessarily because Windows 11 is bad, it's because there's not much, if any, benefit from installing it. So if you can do everything in Windows 10 the same as in Windows 11, if they both accomplish the same task, then why would you pick one over the other? So very little incentive for customers that have Windows 10 now to go through the trouble and hassle of the installation. Even if it's free, they still have to reorient themselves with how Microsoft has moved things into different locations, like that little search highlights feature that's very different to turn off in Windows 11 than it is in Windows 10. Some people will argue that's more difficult. Others will argue it makes more sense. Um, there's no pleasing everybody. And at some point, if you're a manufacturer, you put your foot down and you say, this is what we make. And if you don't like what we make, go somewhere else. There are restaurants I don't eat at because I don't like the food on the menu. I don't like the, 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 the there's German food restaurants. There's no German food I like. So there's nothing on the menu that I'm going to order. So what am I going to do? Start a campaign to tell the German food restaurant to offer Chinese food? That's preposterous. Just don't eat there. That's all. It's a free market. And if Microsoft has a problem with uh, sales numbers from businesses, then of course they're going to react because they have to answer to the shareholders. And that's going to impact share value much more so than on the consumer side of things. Now, looking at the numbers, the numbers are very impressive on this solid state drive. We're looking at 4,810 on our maximum sequential read speed and 3,540 on our maximum sequential write speeds. Now, I've seen a lot of fascination coming from enthusiasts online that always want to see these numbers bigger and bigger and bigger, but we're reaching a point of diminishing returns where, uh, aside from benchmarks, a human being can't really notice much difference between 1,000 uh, megabytes per second on the read and 5,000 megabytes per second on the read. It literally makes, in most cases, a difference of milliseconds. And the faster and the bigger this number gets, the, the milliseconds start diminishing. So let's take a look at this backwards. If your computer takes two minutes to boot, and I can cut your boot time in half, and you've saved a minute, you've gone from two minutes to one minute, that's a significant savings. Now if I cut your boot time in half again, you're only saving 30 seconds from the one minute. If I cut your boot time in half again, you're only saving 15 seconds. If I cut your boot time in half again, you're only saving seven and a half seconds. If I cut your boot time, you see what's happening here, right? What you're getting in return keeps shrinking and shrinking and shrinking, but it keeps costing more and more. Cars are very similar. If you want a car that can do 170 miles an hour, you're going to pay significantly more for that version of the car. Twenty, thirty thousand dollars $30,000 more for the exact same car that's equipped differently to get more horsepower to achieve those kind of speeds from instead of 145, now you can do 163. You're going to pay dearly for that little bit. So your price to performance goes down. You're paying more per horsepower when you reach that. And what you're getting back is less and less and less. So at some point, you're, you, you reach a saturation. And in my experience, for most end users, that saturation is right around 600 megabytes a second. I've never seen an actual end user tell the difference in actually using the computer in boot time or product load time, whether it's 600 megabytes per second or 10,000 megabytes per second. They don't, they don't feel it. It's very subtle. But people chase benchmarks. 
And it's preposterous that they think the benchmarks aren't exaggerating or that they're accurate. Like some, for some reason, the benchmarks are inarguable. <laughs> so my question is, does your computer feel slow to you? And if so, where does it feel slow? And then we can isolate how to improve that versus just throwing more of everything at it because more costs more. And once you reach the saturation point, you are spending more to get less. And the more you spend, the less you're getting in regards to performance that you feel that actually make a difference. Do you think the boot time of this computer would be any different if I put a two and a half inch uh, SATA SSD in it? It will likely boot in nearly, if not the exact same amount of seconds as what it's got in it. So you'd have to be an extreme user to justify needing performance at this level. It, it makes people happy to see the numbers, but the reality is sitting at the computer and actually using it for something, unless it's gaming or something where you're loading files constantly, even then you're going to shave off a few seconds. So, you know, spend your money how you want to spend it, but you do reach a point of diminishing returns on RAM and on storage performance speed, on any performance really, even on CPUs that people are overclocking, you're seeing very little actual real world performance difference in how the computer operates for the vast majority of people. And I mean vast. You got to be someone special <laughs> or have a very special need case where chasing after those numbers makes any sense at all, realistically and in practicality. So I'm very impressed with those numbers because they're, they're far away and above what any user is probably going to be able to take advantage of for more than a few seconds at a time anyway. And um, you know, it's just seconds. Or sometimes it's, in most cases, it's milliseconds. But I'll let you decide what you're willing to spend for what you're going to get back in return. That's up to you. Now, let's take a look at uh, Prime 95. If we start the, uh, what, I want the sensors. I want to see what, uh, this is our temperature monitoring and just sort of overall monitoring of what's going on with our processor and our RAM. And that, with regards to the speed of the processor, and the temperature. So right now, we're sitting at a nice, cool, comfortable 37.8 Celsius. And what I want to do is run Prime 95. I always run version 26.6. .6. I stick with all these defaults. We're going to push all the cores, 16 threads, eight cores, 16 threads at 100%, as well as throw a lot of stuff at the RAM and we're going to monitor how hot the system gets. It's a very unrealistic test because the way folks use their computers is they will have a task that I want the computer to do that will cause the computer to ramp up in speed momentarily to accomplish the task, and then it slows back down. This keeps power consumption down. It keeps heat generation down. That means the fans don't have to work as hard. Uh, doesn't cost as much money in electricity. And that's normal. That's what they're designed to do. What we're doing is we're putting our foot to the floor. It's like getting in a car, putting the, your foot on the gas pedal, pushing it all the way to the floor and keeping it there for 20 minutes. That must be one heck of a road you're on that you could possibly keep your foot, foot to the floor in a car for a full 20 minutes to see if the engine will overheat. It, what road like that exists anywhere? So it's unlikely any customer would ever push a machine as hard as this test pushes it. So if it will go 20 minutes with this extreme use case scenario without having any heat problems, I'm very confident no home user, no business user of any, no user of any kind would ever run into a heat problem under any circumstance unless they intentionally were running some kind of a benchmark over you know, generating a, over in a period of time that is not representative of reality. Which, at 20 minutes, it's not representative of reality. You'd have to go even beyond that. So we'll see how this does. Now, it's already climbed. If I take a look here at our temps, we've already climbed to our max. This row is our maximum here. We're looking at 74 degrees 
Celsius and the test has only been running for about 90 seconds. And if we look, we scroll down, we can see what uh, speed, what megahertz the cores are running at. I think that's down here somewhere. It should show us the individual cores. Uh, that's GPU. Yeah, looks like it's getting up to 4.4. I also like that this test has a clock on it. And well, the test runs and we'll certainly keep an eye on the temps here. I don't want it to hit 86. I want it to be a max of 85 after 20 minutes of torture. If it never reaches 86, there's really, it's very unlikely anybody could cause this computer to overheat under darn near any real world scenario I can imagine. This is so, such a preposterous and ridiculous torture test that if it survives this without any heat issues, yeah, there's the end user is not going to have a heat problem ever, uh, I suppose, unless they block the vents. Let's see, uh, looking in the chat. Do I know which version of Microsoft Office can be used without registering or needing a Microsoft account? Office 2016. Now, Office 2016 and Office 2019 both end support on October 14th of 2025 the same as Windows 10. So if you think Office 2016 is old and not supported, it will be supported as long as Office 2019. And Office 2021, the support's only one year longer. So uh, if you want a version of Microsoft Office that you can activate online without any problems and not have a Microsoft account, Office 2016, the version that's sold at uh, VIP CDK deals, I have a link for it, in the video description below this video is also the cheapest version of Office you can buy. I think it's $26. It's very cheap and it activates online. Now, if you ever have to reinstall and reactivate it in the future, it may not reactivate. So it's important, and I can't stress this enough, that when you've got Office installed and activated, make an image backup of your computer or if you ever have to reinstall Office because you've wiped and reinstalled the computer or you've bought a new computer, you have to understand the license is intended for one machine only. And upon reinstalling it, it looks like you're a pirate. So basically, be prepared to buy another license if you just don't have an image to restore. The good news is you could buy 20 licenses for less than the cost of the retail price Microsoft wants. So even if you had to repurchase it in the future because of a reformat and you did not have an image backup and you had to spend another $26, now you're at a total of $52, which is still a fraction of the retail price. You're still way ahead of the game. But it will activate, and it is guaranteed to activate once. And it'll stay activated indefinitely. It's only when you have to reinstall it you run the potential that it won't reactivate again because it looks like you're pirating the software. Just so you know, <laughs> I just don't want to hear any slack about it. And they basically say as much in VIP CDK deals. It is guaranteed to activate and it will stay activated for life unless you have to reinstall it. Um, you know, like a, you've wiped your OS out and you've reinstalled it or you bought a new computer and you want to move that. It's not a movable license. You can buy a retail license for that. And those are, I think, $450. I'm not mistaken. Um, MSRP from Microsoft. Niall Daly says you could use WPS Office. Yeah, well, there's free Office alternatives, right? Like uh, LibreOffice, OpenOffice, or even uh, Google Office which is all cloud-based. So 
A lot of people, they like to use Microsoft Office because they're comfortable with it and because they need to send files to other people and they want to be certain those people can open those files. And while those compatibility issues have mostly gone away, some of the other platforms won't open older uh, files. So for example, I had a customer ask me if I can open an attachment that a customer of theirs had sent and it was done in WordPerfect 5.1. It was a WP51 file and Microsoft Office will open it. You just have to tell Microsoft Office that it's a WordPerfect 5.1 file. The customer doesn't know how to do that. So what I do for the customer in this case is I load it myself, then I resave it as a docx file and then send it back to them in email and then they can open it and say thank you. So uh, not necessarily can do these conversions with as good of accuracy with the other platforms that are free that might have gotten better and the likelihood of getting those older file formats is as time wears on getting less and less likely but there are benefits to having the genuine Microsoft Office and for $26 for Office 2016 it's hard to go wrong let's see uh, seven and a half minutes on the test Whoops. And we're looking at still a maximum temperature of 77.4. We're doing really, really good. Um, not quite halfway through. We'll let it run for 20 minutes uh, unless it hits 86 or higher between now and then. I don't think it's going to. And furthermore, the fan, well, I can hear it now. It's still relatively quiet. Sarge Tech mentions free office is also good. There's also Zoho. There's, there's a lot of alternatives out there. Some people just want the real thing though, and it is affordable through VIP CDKDs. When you buy from VIP CDK deals, you're not only saving a lot of money for yourself, there is no risk that's guaranteed it's going to activate within, you know, you've got 30 days for any issues, just like any other thing you buy from anybody is a 30 day um, customer service window there. And if, if for any reason, if you were to have any problems with anything I, endorse here, such as VIP CDK deals or Acronis or RoboForm or Instant House Call. If you try these products out or you attempt to and you're not able to and customer service doesn't help you, you reach out to me directly. Nothing that I accept as sponsors is a risk for you. Everything is completely risk-free. RoboForm has a free trial. Acronis has a free trial. You can even download Microsoft Office 2016, 2019, or 2021, and it installs as a free trial. That's how Microsoft does it. Same with Windows 10 and 11. Every version of Windows, as far as I know. So you, there, there's no risk. You know what you're getting. Then when it comes to buying the product key, you're going to buy the product key. If you buy it from VIP CDK deals, it's guaranteed it's going to activate online. You're not going to need to call anybody to activate it in some weird, suspicious way. And it's going to save you money in much the same way that many Americans cross the border into Mexico or Canada to get cheaper medicine. Same medicine, it's less price. Well, this is really no different. It's not illegal. Some people online would have you believe that, uh, that there's a legal issue. There is no legal issue here. It's no different than crossing the border to get the same medications for less money than what they charge here in America. That's all this is. And again, 100% peace of mind. It's completely risk-free. Guaranteed, it's the genuine article. So, if that still doesn't convince you, please pay full retail. <laughs> doesn't bother me. I don't care. But if you want to save some money, uh, I've done the research into the company. I've done the research into the product. And I can tell you it passes everything I need so that my business doesn't get into any hot water. I have a business to run. So, if it's good enough for my business, it's good enough for a home user. I guarantee it. 
Hey, there's Dave Linovitz. He says he's stopping in for a quick hello. He says, we got to get some wings sometime. Hey, right on. He says, wow, you've added color to your wardrobe just for today. It's my version of green. <laughs> Good to see you, Dave. Let's see, we're now at uh, 11 and a half minutes. And yeah, looks like our maximum so far is this middle row, as I mentioned. Our, it says maximum here, so we scroll down, down this row. And it looks like, what, 78.5C on there? Still doing really, really good on our performance, uh, on our heat. Thermal performance, that's the word I wanted. Words. I'm having a fun time with words today. Technus says the key is gray market. Yeah, yeah, anything that is outside of the regular distribution channels, including crossing the border to get cheaper medicines, that's all gray market. It's not illegal. Um, it's gray. As such, uh, they're genuine product keys. They're just intended for a different market. So when you take them out of that market and put them into this market, well, Microsoft doesn't like that because they wanted to profit more from you in this market. So when you take a product for a different market and you bring it over here, it's, it's Japan, I think after a car reaches a few years old, it cannot be driven anymore because of emissions. And those cars that were designed to be sold in Japan get exported out to other countries where they can buy these cars cheap. But those cars were never designed to be in those countries and those are gray market cars. When I was into cameras, 35 millimeter film photography in the 90s, I would buy gray market cameras, cameras that were built for the Japanese market, not intended for America, and they were often significantly cheaper, but had no warranty because the warranty is intended for the market that it was to be sold in. You take it and sell it into a different market, you get no warranty. It's part of the risk you're going to take to save money. Uh, in this case, it doesn't really apply because it's Windows. So once it's activated, it stays activated for life until you do something like try to move it to another system. Now, in the case of Windows, it should automatically reactivate even without you entering a product key. If you buy a key from VIP CDK deals for Windows 10 or 11, you should only need to install that product key once. And as long as you're not changing the motherboard out, it should always reactivate automatically. Office is not so kind. Office thinks you're trying to reinstall it on another machine and therefore requires you to have a new license. You might get lucky and it might reactivate, but I wouldn't expect it to. But if you make a system image of your whole operating system and applications using something like a Cronus or even the built-in imaging tool in Windows, all you have to do is restore your images and all your activations come back unless you've changed your motherboard. All your activations are tied to your motherboard from Microsoft products. Um, but the reinstallation of reusing the same product key again on an OEM key, uh, likely it's not going to work a second time. Just be aware of that. Frank Jimmy says he's just dropping by to say hello and happy Friday to everybody in the chat. Hey, Frank, good to see you. Uh, where are we at? We're a little over 15 and a half minutes on the test. And This is our maximum, is it 79C is our maximum right here. For some reason I was looking at the minimum. I'm like, that's 
37.8 is definitely not where we're at right now. I know that. I was one column off here. Really good thermal performance. I'm very impressed, given that this is such a high-end processor. It does get hot. So their application of liquid metal was a sound engineering decision from my perspective. You don't find that very often on a pre-built computer. It costs more. And it's a little more complicated in manufacturing if you're going to apply it right. In the chat, they want to know if I'm aware of any Microsoft server versions that could be used as desktop alternatives to bypass bloatware and forced reboots of Microsoft desktop versions. It's far, far, far worse than that because there's a lot of software that won't install, like printer drivers and such it may not be available in server versions. A server is, uh, is not intended for a home user, and there's not really much in the way of bloatware. Where you get bloatware is generally from pre-built PCs from the big manufacturers like Dell and HP, those big systems integrators, or SIs. Um, and really, it's not a big deal to go into the control panel and just uninstall those. It's really nothing. All those utility software that used to take the, the bloatware out, those are all gone because they just don't need them anymore. Really, there's really nothing to uninstalling it. Or you can always just do a fresh install of Windows yourself if you buy a system a machine from a system integrator. These days, they really don't do that much anymore. At least I'm not seeing it. It used to just be offer after offer after offer on a new PC. Just all of these third-party applications that were paying money to the system integrator, and that enabled them to sell the system to the public for less money, right? So you want everything. Give it to me cheap and give it to me 100% clean, you know, free of any bloatware. Uh, you got to pick one or the other, you know, so you can always do a wipe and a reinstall. But going into the control panel under the apps and just uninstalling the things you don't want is very fast. It doesn't cause any harm to Windows. It's really not a problem that needs to be solved. But trying to run a server OS in a home, you're likely going to have a very difficult time with drivers. That simply, um, when you're putting consumer electronics onto a enterprise class computer, you may find it's just not compatible or no drivers exist. So. I wouldn't go down that road. Maybe you'd be better off switching to Linux if you're of that mindset. Something that would be, if you have that personality of control, then Linux would be a much better aligned with your expectations and requirements than Windows will ever be, server or otherwise, in my opinion. Dave Linovitz said he used to like Windows 2000 server for home use. That's going back a ways, isn't it? Did you ever try using Windows NT for home use? <laughs> of course, there are people like OS2 Warp too, so to each their own. Which, Lin which Linux distros do I recommend? I don't recommend any particular Linux distro. I'm not a Linux channel. But if you go uh, here on YouTube, you'll see a plethora of uh, Linux and, uh, enthusiast channels, and they would know far more about it than I would. And it really depends on what it is you're looking to accomplish. There are many very good versions of Linux, but are completely wrong. Some versions or flavors of the distro are completely wrong for some people. So it really depends what it is your end goal. And I would go to a, a Linux uh, community to get more information on that. This is a Windows-based community. I run a business, and I'm trying to stay in business, and there's no business for me in Linux, not much of it. So I, I go where the, the most opportunity for work is, and that's the Windows platform. If that ever changes, then my business will have to adapt or I'll have to get out of business. And I'm just sharing my experience here as a professional in this space because most of the channels and information online is put up by enthusiasts. And so that's fine, but it's very one-sided. There's a lot of practicality, in my opinion, that's completely ignored. And uh, without full disclosure to the audience that this is enthusiast versus professional, the audience may not know there's any difference There are alternatives.
And of course, there's people or uh, participants in the chat room recommending their favorite flavors of Unix as well, or Linux rather. And uh, certainly worth considering those comments in chat as well as my own for whatever is right for your needs. Uh, let me take a look where we're at. We're at 21 minutes, almost 22 minutes. So we've already gone over the 20 minutes of torture testing here. And our maximum looks like we've hit 70, what is that? I'm gonna move up closer to the screen. 79.1 is our maximum temperature. So we're still far away from 85. And that makes me very happy, very happy. Now, if I stop this test, let's see how fast it cools down. Pay attention to this number right here. This is our current temperature on the left side. I'm gonna stop the test. Let's watch that. Watch how fast it drops. What little fan noise there was is practically gone completely silent now, and our temperatures continue to drop. That's wonderful. Do you have any questions about this computer that I can answer for you? Any concerns about it? I'd be, I'll do my best to provide an answer. I may not know it, but I can try. Dave Linovitz says that's an impressive little system. It's hard to believe you can get that kind of performance uh, out of the CPU, out of the graphics card, out of the RAM. And it's so quiet, it's so compact, and it's very, very inexpensive. Like I said, I challenge any of you to put together a system with the same specs. By any case, by any power supply, by any motherboard, match the CPU, match the amount of RAM, match the size of solid state drive, and consider the cost of the Windows 11 Pro as well and let me know what number you get. I think it's going to be well over the price. It won't even be close. This will probably be $200 minimum cheaper than trying to build it yourself. Do I know who manufactures the motherboard on this little computer? Well, as far as I'm concerned, it's Minis Forum, but we can run um, CPU-Z just to see what's being reported back, but likely it'll say it's, well, if I guess I'll probably bite myself in the butt, right? Let's take a look at what CPU-Z says here. So the manufacturer says Shenzhen Megayo Electronic Equipment. I don't know who that is. I don't know who owns them or who manufactures them. No idea. And of course, the chipset is a silicon on chip Ryzen processor. Does that matter who makes the motherboard? I'm just curious, like, who cares? It is a Chinese motherboard. Well, as I made clear in the beginning of the video, when I was showing off the box, and I'll show it again in case you missed it. In fact, let's, uh, before I walk over to the camera, let me make it full screen just to make sure that you guys can read it. Keep pushing the wrong buttons here. Bear with me for a second. Okay. There is nothing being hidden here. It clearly says that the company is located in Hong Kong and that the product is made in China. So um, if you're dealing with Hong Kong, you're dealing with China. I mean, if that's taken in a negative way, then every Apple product is also Chinese. 
It's also from China, right? All those iPhones and Mac minis, they're all made there. And people often regard them as being very well built. So I don't know that that's, if we're implying anything here, but um, just because it comes from somewhere, it's almost a force of, it's almost a form of racism to imply that anything that comes from here is going to be excellent or terrible. It, it runs the gamut depending on the manufacturer and what sort of values the manufacturer has. Patrick wants to know if I think the 64 gig model would be a good fit for a YouTube content creator. Um, probably not. And I only say that because in most instances, most people barely use 16 gigs of RAM, maybe up to 24 gigs of RAM. So to have 32 gigs of RAM is likely uh, all they would, more than they would ever use or more than they would use in the immediate future, right? And I don't, and I'm talking about video editing. Your video editing software, depending on what video editing software you have, may rely more on the graphics card, may rely more on the CPU. It's less likely going to rely on the speed of your storage or how much RAM you have beyond what it takes to run in memory. So most cases, that's somewhere under 32 gigs. So if you spent the extra money for the 64 gigs and you're never exceeding 32, you've wasted your money on something you're not using. It won't benefit most people. Where 64 gigs of RAM would come into hand, it come in handy is if you're, if you're somebody who has 97 different browser tabs open at the same time, and when you click between the tabs, you want it to respond very quickly. It's, it would have to be such an excessive use of the equipment and the resources to justify that. Uh, I wouldn't recommend it for most people. It's just chasing numbers with no apparent purpose. More is always better, but uh, if you've got the money to burn, I can't imagine it's gonna hurt anything. It just seems like a money could be better spent, save the money on the RAM and put it more towards more storage. Even the speed of the storage doesn't really matter. If, if you offer me a terabyte of storage at uh, 4,000 megabytes a second or 5,000 megabytes per second read speeds, or for the same price or a few dollars more, I can double, triple, or quadruple that storage amount and cut the speed to a quarter. I'll take the, me personally, I'll take the storage capacity. Anything over 600 megabytes per second, likely not going to make much difference. For the vast majority of people, they won't notice it other than out, outside of uh, benchmarks. You wouldn't really notice it. It's milliseconds of difference. So I'd rather put the money into something I would use. So. When you're making videos, especially if they're high quality 4K videos or lengthy videos like the ones I make that run hours, you're going to end up with big files. And the more often you make videos, the more big files you're going to have, the sooner you're going to run out of storage space. But you're likely never going to use that RAM over 32 gigs, not anytime soon, unless, of course, like I said, you're somebody that does numerous things simultaneously on one machine. Very few people would benefit from that. But having the extra capacity for storage, I think, would be something that is just a matter of time. You will use it if you're using it in that way. Icaranus wants to know on the AD03, if I recall which LAN chipset that unit uses. I don't remember. I think you could go back and uh, uh, look at the video. I don't have the AD03 here to hook up and answer that question. Um, why? Why does it matter to you if it's Realtek or Intel? Like what, how does one hold more value to you than another? You're just curious? Or is there a real technical concern? I genuinely want to know because I can't tell any difference between killer network cards and Intel cards and Realtek cards and Ethereum cards. What, what is it you're looking for or concerned about? 
So again, I always encourage questions, but I sometimes the question leaves me questions like, what's the point? What don't I know here? <laughs> That's what I'm afraid of, fear of missing out, FM, FOMO, right? What a, is there something, is there a problem with something that I don't know about? Morton says, hey, Carrie, great to see you live. Looking good. Well, thank you, Morton. Thank you for joining us in the chat. Appreciate your kind words as well. Nicaragua says it's a specific use case. Enlighten me. Like, what specific use case does that matter? And I don't mean that sarcastically. I'm genuinely... Uh, sincerely curious. I'm not aware of any specific use case that depends on the manufacture of the LAN um, chip or the, even the LAN driver. So what what is it I don't know? I guess I, I want to know what I don't know. <laughs> I'd like to be aware of things I'm not aware of. Is that a real thing? The operating system I want to use typically recommends Intel NICs. What operating system does that? I feel like you're teasing me. <laughs> Is it secret? Debian? I could certainly understand if uh, certain built-in drivers in a specific operating system or that certain attention, more attention is paid to a specific uh, brand or model. Um, what I can tell you is that even though uh, certain network interface cards may be recommended by an operating system. It doesn't mean those are the only ones that work. And if you were to buy the AD03, if you were thinking about it and you were on the fence because you didn't know who the chipset was of the NIC, uh, I would say buy it from Amazon. You have a 30-day return window. You can return for any reason or no reason. And Amazon will allow you to return that at no cost to you within 30 days and you'll have your answer because even if it's not on the recommended list it doesn't mean it's not going to work and you just basically would have to try it to see and I would be very curious what your results were and then I would be able to answer the question if anybody else were to ask. When did I start using lights inside of my desktops? I remember you bashing it a couple of years ago. Have I not bashed it today? I, I try to bash that as often as possible. I'm a YouTube content creator, and I like people to see the streaming computer. And sometimes the thumbnails used in the videos are a freeze frame of one of my images, and sometimes people will click on a video because they see all the lights. It, it's like something shiny. I do this because it's to attract attention online. I don't do this to attract attention in my own home. I'm not trying to impress anybody in my own home. If you've been in my home, you're already, you know, that is in and of itself an approval from me. I'm not necessarily looking for an approval from them. It, when it comes to being online, I will still put this down every day. This is a complete waste of money for that RGB, those colors. Waste of money. In my opinion, I don't have a single business customer that has a glass panel on a computer, let alone RGB or liquid cooling. I'm in business. This is not a, a hobby for me. This isn't something I just pour money into because I can. And so if I can attract viewers through fancy lights, 
if that somehow implies to the general public that I know what I'm doing because look how fancy that is. Well, I'm more than happy. I'm more than happy to do that if it results in getting more viewers. But it's absolute pandering. How's that for an honest answer? Ron says he's been here many times. I'm not a flashy person. Yeah, I want somebody to like me for who I am, not for what I appear to be. Um, you don't see me wearing fancy clothes or jewelry and stuff like this. You know, if you like me because the stuff I have is cool, it's not a good reason to like me. You know, like me for who I am. But when it comes to getting people to click on your channel, you've got to get some reason for people to click. And a lot of people that are just general users, they see stuff like this is really fancy and high end and technical and sort of it gets a false sense of credibility that I know what I'm doing. The fact that I run a business and I've been running a business for over two decades, a lot of businesses in this industry don't stick around that long, is not convincing enough to the general public. They, they need flash and, you know, whatever, if that's what it takes. I hated every minute of this. I did not like this, putting this together and doing all the cable management. In fact, the final cable management, I paid uh, Photo Ray, a member in our chat. I paid him to do it because I just had enough. It's just stupid. Gerald Arthur Hall in the chat says, it's called eye candy. That's exactly right. It's bling for the internet, not for real life. If you see the Studio A computer, it's just a Corsair 200R, and it's way faster than this, much, much faster. This is a 9900KS chip, and Studio A is just a plain black box with like a 13900K in there, and... Um, I'm just running the onboard graphics on the Intel 13900K. I don't need a fancy graphics card. That graphic card doesn't even need to be in there. That's a 3070. I don't, I don't need it. All, all the stuff I do here is so little uh, requirements. That's way overkill. But it looks good, doesn't it? Patrick Doyle says, I love your logo on the CPU. Yeah, that's that was done by a viewer, uh, Selden Bell. You'll often see him here in the live chat room. And uh, I asked a viewer to, to, I asked the viewers in general to submit ideas for taking advantage of the little screen on the liquid cooler to give it like a 3D spinning effect. And he came up with that and it's beautiful. And I mean, he did it quick, like it was nothing. <laughs> I wouldn't know how to do that. And I didn't really want to learn how, so I was very grateful to Selden for contributing it. It looks fantastic. He did a wonderful job. Bob Peterson says, FYI, Debian does not require Intel. Debian supports i386 Intel or Intel compatible 32-bit processors. Well, AMD 64 means an Intel or Intel compatible 64-bit processor. You know, you consider when I started with computers, it was, um, there was a pretty significant barrier to entry. You wasn't really anybody to learn from. You sort of had to figure things out. And we're talking days when your processor speed was uh, like a 286.12. And now, you know, this little mini computer's at 4,400. Do you know the difference between 12? <laughs> And 4,400, this technology has evolved to such a point that it blows my mind how far we've come and how short of a time. We used to have to put floppy controllers. It was a board, a floppy controller that went in to the main board. 
there's no built-in floppy. There was no built-in sound. There was no internet. There was everything. You had to add everything, literally. You had to add a video card. You had to add, if you were lucky enough to be able to afford a hard drive, uh, you would have to add a controller specific to that type of drive. If it was MFM or RLL, um, floppy disks, five and a quarter inch floppy disks. Um, you, you would have to add a floppy controller to the motherboard manually. So, you know, it, everything was bigger. There were lots and lots of chips, lots of them. Nowadays, they can take all those chips and put it on one little chip smaller than the, than my, the nail, my fingernail on my pinky. All those chips across the board were required, and now it's all in one little tiny surface-mounted chip, <laughs> that and more. In such a short period of time, the fact that that's accomplished in my lifetime and to see it just in the last uh, 30, 40 years, 40 years, I suppose, what an amazing amount of evolution we've seen with technology. You know, the fact that we can basically have a whole computer in our pocket and we call it a phone is amusing to me. This is not a phone. This is a computer that has a phone app on it. It'd be like calling that computer an arcade. It's not an arcade. It has an arcade app, potentially. It's fascinating. Never saw it coming. Yeah. How many kids today do you see actually use their phones as a phone? They'll use it as a messaging device. They'll use it as an entertainment device. But to actually call somebody and talk to them, very rarely. <laughs> but we still call it a phone. <laughs> Crazy. Chris Johnson says, if you go to O'ReillyAuto.com, you can search for a flux capacitor in their parts catalog. This is true. It was an, uh, an April Fool's joke, and they just never took it down. There's a YouTube channel, uh, what's it called? Adrian's Digital Basement, something like that. And he resuscitates really old computers. And if you have nostalgia or you are curious because you weren't into computers back in the 80s, he has these original IBM and IBM clones. And he explains what everything is, what each chip was. Boy, I was, I was watching that the other day and I forget all about like the UART chips that were required, like the 16550. You needed a chip for a serial port. If you had two serial ports, you needed two UART chips. And the original UART chips didn't have any buffers. So if your hard drive was, you know, writing slower than the data coming in on the serial port, you'd have all kinds of problems. So that 16550 was a big deal when it came out. That chip was about yay big too. And just one chip for one serial port. And the buffer was only like 16 bytes. It wasn't, but that made a massive performance difference. And uh, if you're interested in that computer archaeology, Adrian's Digital Basement, I think, is the name of the channel. And if you like some other humorous, lighthearted reviews on hardware that are very practical, Dawid does tech stuff. It's like David, but with a W, Dawid. Check out his channel. He's very good. If you like more interaction with repairs, uh, check out Doug Betts live training, live Windows training with Doug Betts. Does a video nearly every day, live interaction with his audience and answering their questions and solving, uh, helping to solve whatever technical problems they're having. Zach Bischoff says, hello. Hey, welcome in, Zach. I don't know if there's any other questions about the minis forum. Once again, this is the um, UM773 light. It has numerous configurations you can buy it, and this one represents the 16 gigs of RAM and 512 gig SSD. It is a Gen 4 SSD, as we saw earlier from our Crystal Discmark results. For what you're getting for the price, this is absolutely a desktop replacement 
for a casual gamer, no problem. If you want to get into some real high-end settings on your games, if you want to play them in 4K and a lot of settings, you're probably still going to have to stick with something larger or because this does support USB 4, you might be able to if they're, I'm not quite sure if they have USB 4 enclosures for video cards. I know they have them for Thunderbolt. So it would make sense that they should have them now for USB 4. They might already be compatible. You could buy, you know, your $1,200 graphics card or your $1,800 graphics card, put it in an external enclosure and get the exact same gaming performance as you would out of a desktop with the same graphics card. But now you've got a much smaller package and you don't necessarily need to keep that graphics card plugged in if you're not using it. So then you can have this take up less desk space and require less power. You know, like I said, with having that GeForce 3070 in there that I'm not using, that's obviously consuming more power than the onboard video that's built into the CPU, which would be plenty for what I'm doing right now with it. You would not see any difference uh, as far as doing any live streaming. It would make no impact whatsoever to the quality of the video or the frame rate. Bob Peterson said, yep, Adrian's Digital Basement is on YouTube and a great resource for the old stuff. Absolutely. I mean, I don't know what he does with all that stuff once he gets it working. I can't imagine it serves any purpose. He just seems to enjoy it. Chris Johnson said, at one time I had an Atari 800 that had an external five and a quarter inch floppy disk. So did I. Yep, back in the 80s. He says, all of it was lost in a flood. Mine was sold off. I recently, not recently, but within the past few years, I had somebody bring me an Atari 400 with a lot of games and accessories, and I did sort of a throwback video of how I got started in the industry. Once I was done with the video, I got rid of all that stuff because I don't have room for it. And it, if I feel nostalgic for the old Atari 400, Atari 800 games, I just search YouTube for Mule or Preppy or <laughs> Caverns of Mars, and I can watch it recorded and... and um, It's just like loading it up myself without having all the cabling and dust and stuff. I don't need to play it. I watch it and I go, oh yeah, I remember that. That was fun. And every once in a while, I'll think of a title like Karatika Droll, you know, something like that. And I'll say, oh, I remember that. And then I'll look it up on YouTube to see if anybody's done a video on it. I, there's nothing I haven't been able to find. Uh, in fact, I'm finding stuff I forgot to look for. Because when you run across a channel that does that and you click to see what other videos they've done, it'll often bring up other games I've completely forgotten about, like Spy vs. Spy. And yeah, I'm like, oh yeah, I completely forgot about Spy vs. Spy. It was a fun game. Devin says, still doing networks today is much easier. Yeah, for sure. Everything's easier. My friends, Ron says he remembers my old Atari computer, yeah. Dwayne says uh, back in the day, his thing was thin net token ring cabling, bridges and hubs. Yeah, yeah, been there, done that. All right, well, to summarize, the Mini Sporum Venus series, this UM773 Lite, I think is a great value for the money. Again, they're not paying me to make this video. This is my honest this, uh, summary and my honest opinion of the machine. I think if things keep moving the direction they're moving on these mini PCs and as they become, as the general public becomes more aware of how much money they can save and how much less room they take up, I can foresee a day very soon where the home users that have desktop computers today will realize they don't need them anymore. And I also foresee me recommending to my business clients that we start switching them over to mini PCs. I've got one client that has two nooks, but they're the long skinny nooks about yay big. Well, this is a bit taller, it's a lot shorter. And they liked the first nook so much they wanted a second one. So that's already replaced two desktops. And they've got about 15. I think when those other 13 get old and need to be upgraded, I'm probably going to recommend um, a mini PC of whatever good value it is at that time in a few years. Probably 
when it's time to go to Windows 11, rather than upgrade what they've got to Windows 11, I think we should just buy many PCs that will come pre-equipped, pre-loaded with Windows 11, or even maybe Windows 12 at that time. And that's going to be the end of those Corsair 200Rs for all but the most demanding users. And none of my business clients are demanding users in that regard where they need a graphics card, you know, discrete graphics, where they need that big tower. And I think the customers are going to be very delighted at how much money they're saving and how much smaller the units are that they're not taking up as much room. I think reliability is going to be identical. I don't think they're going to have any problems with these mini PCs, just as they're not having problems with the desktops I build. The reason I build them is I don't want to support someone else's computers. It could end up costing me a lot of money. So when I build systems for my clients, I'm doing it on the condition that I'm supporting those systems. And I build them in a way that obviously they're as reliable as I can make them. And then that means, well, I'm not making much money on the sale of the computer. Sometimes I'm just breaking even. Where I am making the money is in the ongoing support of the computer. My concern about these little mini PCs is there's very little I can do to repair them, but repair is very rare. If they're built well, built with quality, they should just last until they're not useful anymore. I have suspect somebody like Adrian's Digital Basement YouTube channel could in the future be looking at these mini PCs 30 years from now and probably many of them will be in better shape and will boot up much, much better than the systems from 30 years ago he's looking at today. I guess it's 40 years ago. Getting old. So if he's pulling up a system that's 40 years old, a lot of those systems don't work. There's some corrosion involved, but there's also just so many chips, there's so much to go wrong. There's far less to go wrong when everything's condensed down and, you know, you've got hundreds of chips all on one little chip. And I suspect you'll be able to take these, plug them in 30 or 40 years from now. And I suspect that they are likely going to boot up just fine. And that the ones that don't work anymore, those will be the rare exception. But it's kind of the other way around with the... Uh, but that's, that's the technology, how it's evolving. It makes perfect sense. Like, I don't know what you would do with it in 40 years any more than I know what he's doing with these 40-year-old machines he's resuscitating. But um, the point I'm trying to get to is it will likely not be very useful and therefore need to be replaced because you'll need more resources, you'll need more power, you'll need more something as the operating systems evolve, as the internet evolves, and how we use the computer evolves. That's what I suspect, especially in a business environment, not necessarily a home. Home environment as a consumer can get away with a consumer device. I'll check my phone here real quick to see if there's any contributions made, and then we'll wrap it up for today's video. Um, when I picked it up, it vibrated at me, so somebody's trying to reach me. Um, oh, $20 came in from Gary Tatum. Right on. Well, thank you, Gary. Thanks for supporting the channel. And of course, thanks to um, everybody for your contributions during today's live broadcast. Uh, and there's going to be a shout out to Winston Liu, Kurt Schlegel, Mike Visions, Gerhard Huff, Jimmy McGregor, Rick Lakes, Roy Starman, Alan Lindus, Ferris, Peter Laycock, or as we call him, Buster, and Garfield Rupe, who uh, became a member today. And thanks to all of you for your support, enabling me to continue making more videos more often. And thank you for being a wonderful part of this amazing community that we've created. Um, it's so much more enjoyable for me to not deal with harassment, and bots, and all the nonsense that comes with the channel getting more and more popular and the scrutiny. It's discouraging at times. And today has been a real pleasure. You guys have been a great, wonderful, I don't want to say audience, because I, you know, audience implies we're not interacting, that you're just listening. I really enjoy the interaction. And for those of you who have been brave enough to ask a question, thank you for doing that. And to all my friends in blue and all my supporters, again, thank you for supporting the channel. Thank you to Phil at Minis Forum for sending us the PC for review. And if you have any follow-up questions and you missed the live video, just leave it in the comments below and I'll try and get an answer for you. Thank you for watching. Enjoy St. Patrick's Day. Enjoy the rest of your Friday. Have a safe weekend. I will see you all again very, very soon. 
Members only videos are done every Monday at one o'clock Pacific time. Those videos are never made public. They are for members only. They're very often hangouts. Audience of maybe three dozen people tops. So your ability to interact with me in a much smaller, more intimate environment is a benefit of being a member. If you um, haven't become a member, there are benefits to the membership. And uh, try it, see if you like it. It helps support the channel. And uh, for those of you that are members, every Monday at one o'clock, I make a private members only video and love to engage in conversation. That's just off the cuff hangout most of the time. And then if there's anything special, like the repair video I did earlier this week, that's also for members only. So I do try continually to do things for my members. If uh, members need personal help with the technical problem, uh, do whatever I can for them because they're very, very critical to my ability to make more content. It's just very expensive to make content. So um, that was a benefit of Minis Forum sending the PC. Well, they're not paying me to make the video. I'm also free to be open and honest about it. And openly and honestly, I like this little computer and I think it's a really good deal. If you end up buying one or any mini PC, I'd be very curious what your experience with any manufacturer of any model of mini PC has been. Uh, whether or not you think they're great or you hate them, I'd love to know what it is and why. In the meantime, that's going to wrap it up for me for today. Thanks for watching. I'll see you all very, very soon. Until next time, bye for now.